Well, it's safe to say that this video idea got out of hand really fast. Get your snacks ready. The Ben 10 franchise, something so big it's almost hard to fathom. It's gone from looking like this, to this, to this, heck, even this but we'll talk about that one a little bit later. Hitting it just the right time when Cartoon Network was digging their hooks into the action cartoon genre, little did they know that this new and interesting cartoon about a boy who can turn himself into an array of aliens to save the day with his cousin and grandpa would turn into one of the network's biggest and most important intellectual properties. Starting this journey to watch every single Ben 10 series and film didn't seem as terribly daunting as it felt while going through it. From 2005 to now, Ben 10 has spanned five different series of shows containing a total of nearly 400 episodes including specials, a handful of movies, and some shorts. That's a lot more than I expected if I'm being honest, but what made it so much more of a heavy task was the complex interconnected story that runs through the different series creating a narrative that only feels more and more put together like a case board and your Charlie trying to put it all together the more you watch. You wanna talk about stress? You wanna talk about stress? I mean that in a good way for the most part. Today, I wanted to take a deep dive look into the world of Ben 10 and experience it all in succession versus the way I watched part of it as it came out. For me personally, anything beyond the third series, Ultimate Alien, it's all new territory for me. I remember when the fourth series, Omniverse, came out and for some reason I never continued from Ultimate Alien to it, thinking it was just a reboot of the series when it was more of a refresh and still a continuation. As far as the fifth series, which was a reboot, all I know is that it now looks more in line with the middle 2010s Cartoon Network look. Over these few videos, we will cover a lot of ground. While some will be familiar to me, a lot will be new and hopefully exciting. I wanna get into the juicy nuances of this show, what makes it tick and the effects it had on its fans, the industry, and beyond. Also, with knowing the popularity of the franchise, it's bound to have some thoroughly mixed opinions, especially from the original versus where we are currently at all this time later. I find myself at this unique position of being a fan of the show early on, but having no preconceived notions about where it went to after that. I just never watched it. Welcome to Ben 10. I have so been looking forward to this. Welcome back to the 25 Days of Fringe Miss, where there's going to be brand new- Wait, 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 wait. Uh-uh. Ah, double fringe miss. Aw, you only thought you were gonna get 25 videos this year? Look at you. You look silly. But I'm here to fix that because I'm gonna give you not only 25 videos, but I'm giving you 50 videos. I have two channels. That's two fringe misses. Each day there'll be a brand new video on both channels for 25 days. I haven't slept in months. Enjoy the content. Or don't. All right. Cartoon Network in the mid 2000s was quickly pivoting a lot of their shows into a more action packed focus with the creators behind Ben 10 being the catalyst for a lot of what the action genre would look like for the network. The popularity of this show would spiral out of control to legacy heights that seem unattainable to most cartoons, even nowadays. Other shows like Mega's XLR and even Man of Action's other work for the network get overshadowed and pushed aside because nothing was bringing in the attention and more importantly to them, the money like Ben 10 was. It has a great name, a great premise, and it was marketable. What kid at the time wouldn't want to have the power to turn themselves into a selection of aliens that give you superhero-like power so you can become an interdimensional, intergalactic, interspecies legend? Oh, is that the Omnitrex in the Target toy aisle for $30 and something I can beg my mom for? If you can't tell, this is where the madness begins. Because something like this can't last forever. Right? Something at some point has got to give, but any time the network noticed that happening, it was just time to give everything an update, which resets the marketability. And oh boy, is that the new Omnitrex for $35 in the Target toy aisle? Only a few franchises ever reached this level of notoriety, growth, and longevity. While not as big as something like Pokemon, Minecraft, or in more recent years, Fortnite, there is an easy case to put Ben 10 possibly in the top 10 when you see the bigger picture by the end of this series. 
The original Ben 10 series, later referred to as Ben 10 Classic, was first shown off in the form of a teaser trailer for Cartoon Network's Cartoon Sneak Peek Week on December 27, 2005. It premiered its first official episode on January 14, 2006, just over three weeks later. Our story starts off with a call to action for our main protagonist, the adorably bratty and arrogant young 10-year-old Ben Tennyson. On the last day of school, his grandfather Max picks him up for their summer RV camping trip, and he quickly discovers his cousin, Gwen, is joining them. These two are not particularly happy about this fact as they are at constant odds butting heads about everything from larger issues to the smallest of annoyances. Ben here is always more of the agitator for these situations, and don't get me wrong, Gwen does jump in to dish it right back, but it's usually the attitude served by Ben's 10-year-old angst. After a particularly rough first day of summer vacation, Ben decides to go on a walk. During his walk, while he's strolling the woods with his woes, he is kind of attacked by a watch looking device that has fallen from space toward him. The watch attaches itself to his wrist and of course, he's gotta touch all the buttons. Without wasting any time, he transforms himself into a fire being. And you know what? Fire and forests are not the best combination contrary to popular belief. Who would have thought? So yes, he proceeds to start a wildfire that quickly gets out of control. Seeing the flames, Grandpa Max and Gwen proceed to run toward the fire, which is definitely not what you're supposed to do if you ever find yourself in this circumstance. But nevertheless, they were worried about Ben. They discover that Ben is actually the fire being, and after literally fighting fire with fire, they manage to quell the flames. Obviously, this whole situation has kind of shaken up everyone, or so we think. Grandpa Max specifies that Ben hadn't transformed into a monster, but instead an alien species. He's not a monster. He's an alien. And he suspiciously seems to know something about this watch, being appropriately wary of the kind of attention it may draw for them. Now, why would a plumber who plums things know anything about the difference between monsters and aliens, and this weird watch device? Something here isn't adding up, and it's not because I'm bad at math. In the following episodes, we learn a lot about the watch, the Omnimatrix, or also called the Omnitrix. Its unpredictability, its catalog of various alien life forms when it times out, who is actively hunting it down and why Grandpa Max seems to know so much about it. The overall big bad of the show, Vilgax, aka Space Calamari, is after the watch and deploys so many different tactics to try and get it. From going in full force and brutal, to psychologically manipulating, and even sending in some bounty hunters to get the job done. He should have done better on his resume read-throughs before hiring because one of them is a double agent, Tetrex, a Petrosapien, which is the same race as Ben's Diamond Head. This character becomes the base guide to what the Omnitrex is, and will lead to some important stuff in the Secret of the Omnitrex special, but we will get to that later. Why is this watch so important? Why does Vilgax need to get his hands on it? Why does Tetrix know so much about it? So many questions. Oh, you'd like answers? Sure, that makes sense. The Omnitrix itself is at the center of this massive galactic war due to the power it holds. And I'm not just talking about the alien DNA, I mean it's literally a major power source that can literally blow up the universe! But we don't need to worry about that just yet. There's a lot here to this show than just the base concept would have you believe. This all coming from the minds of Man of Action. Be right back. Man of Action, a company founded by four men? Mans? Mans of Action? Men of Action? Since their founding, they have created some pretty impressive shows along with some video games and graphic novels, like Disney XD's Ultimate Spider-Man, Marvel's Avengers Assemble, Big Hero 6 Comics, and much more. The Creator Studio and Writer Collective was created back in 2000, and with an origin story like theirs, it kind of seems like fate meant for their ideas to come to fruition. Four friends, Joe Casey, Joe Kelly, Duncan Rolu, and Steven T. Siegel. They started to get tired of having to walk the floor of San Diego Comic-Con every year. They decided to invest in booking their own table for the following year's convention, and were placed in a very way-in-the-back location of the convention and called themselves Man of Action. They were approached by a filmmaker who asked for their assistance in writing four short films, which he had recently received funding for. They agreed, and although they are currently unsure of whatever came of those shorts, the projects were enough to get the ball rolling. They were kind of 
forced into properly establishing their company as an official LLC when a check was made out to just Man of Action, and they realized they wouldn't be able to cash it without making it official, and hence why we have the studio that we know today. As a team of comic lovers and writers, they had all met through prior experience in writing for various graphic novels like X-Men and Superman, which aided in them being enlisted to make X-Men Legends, an Activision video game. This helped them get their start with an interviewer who was familiar with the four of them, Matt Senreich, co-creator of Robot Chicken on Adult Swim. He recommended them to Cartoon Network. Senreich was approached by the network with an idea of making a new action hero TV show, just like the Fantastic Four, but with new heroes and for kids. Through Senreich, Cartoon Network invited the four of them to pitch their ideas for this new superhero kid show. The Mans of Action were very open about hating the idea of a Fantastic Four type of show for kids, so they came up with 20 very different ideas and pitched them all in 20 minutes. Rapid fire, 60 seconds a pitch. The network landed on lucky number seven, plus one. They, they landed on eight. Every 60 seconds we're gonna pitch you a different show and then we're just gonna move along. You'll know when you hear it. And we did the first one, 60 seconds in, it wasn't even done, rang the bell, moved on to the next one. Eighth thing we did was Ben 10, and Sam was just like, stop, that's it. We'll take it. Which was inspired by the Men of Action's childhood desire to transform into not just one superhero, but ten superheroes. Greedy. And you guessed it, show idea number eight would transform itself into the multi-billion dollar superhero franchise just a few years later, now known as Ben. 10. Well, this was the early idea for Ben 10. The concept is still there, but looking at Stephen E. Gordon's art, we see the superhero aspect of it was very much just humans in special suits and all have some sort of special powers. I mean, look at Ben. Who is he? Later on, the idea would morph more into the alien concept, while still keeping the humanoid body type intact. A solid array of looks here that would essentially be the rough drafts for the final versions we would come to see. Yo, is Grey Matter okay? I think someone should check on Grey Matter. I do like this classic watch look the Omnitrix has. That's the Rolex of Omnitrixes. The Omni Rolex. Sophisticated. We did have these screenshots from the test footage that was previously lost up until 2021, where we have a few seconds of very bad quality footage confirming its existence. But looking just at the pictures, it's a bit uncanny. Ben is just slightly off from his final look and Gwen apparently didn't get a haircut. And shout out to the Ben 10 archive Tumblr for the footage and images. As far as the show goes, Ben himself is an interesting character. I mean, heck, he should be. His name's the title of the show. From the jump, we get to see his interactions with his cousin and grandpa as Ben comes off as the I know better type who hears things in one ear and it's right out the other. He kinda sucks, but in the charming way that Ben is still a kid with this new weight on his shoulders or uh, wrist of being this protector of the Omnitrix. We see throughout the series him dealing with struggles of having to be the one to carry this burden while at the same time loving the abilities he has from it. In later series, we deal with this a little bit more, but we even see moments where there may be a reward or notoriety for the heroism once the public cheers on the works of the aliens that keep saving the day. If there's anything I can do to repay you... Well, now that you mention it... Grandpa! At first, Ben is like, hey, some fame, some thanks for my hard work, and money on top of that, sign me up. Rescued a bunch of people from a burning building or any superhero guilt? pretty low. But again, he's 10, and so Grandpa is very much his guide into how to go about this in all the right and proper ways. And what do I get? Nothing. Being a hero isn't about others knowing you did something good. It's not fair. Being a hero is its own reward. He's not saving the day for money, he's saving the day because that's the right thing to do. With great power comes great profits in the toy market. Beyond this, Ben often comes off selfish in many situations that result in upsetting Grandpa Max and annoying Gwen. Do you expect me to trust you if you keep misusing the watch? I do like the disconnected family feeling dynamic the show goes for. There are moments where they are all in chaos, tensions are high, and not everyone is in the best mood to be nice. But we get some moments in between where we just get to see them all have some downtime or fun along their cross-country drive. We see the bickering between Ben and Gwen but we still get those subtle moments that there is care for one another. 
even if Ben is still a jerk. As for the rest of the characters in the original series, Grandpa Max is the peacekeeper that really just tries his best to make sure Gwen and Ben don't rip each other's heads off. He is a kind, older gentleman who proves to be extremely limber and essential in a fight despite being a grandpa. His main personality attributes are incorporating strange bugs and sea creatures into his culinary ventures, and being the coolest person ever. He trained to be an astronaut and has actually been in space. He always references his plumber days, but as we watch the series, it's quickly revealed revealed that the Plumbers are a secret society that serve as an intergalactic peacekeeper and overall protectors of Earth. His honest but really interesting slightly secretive personality leaves a lot to be discovered and you can't help being naturally drawn to him as a character. This whole plumber business becomes quite the major character identity and plot point as we move on to the other series of Ben 10. Even when it comes to the overall villain, he personally already dealt with him and won. Grandpa Max is the original, original Ben 10, but instead of turning into several aliens to defend the universe, he gets with aliens. No. Really, the Roswell alien was actually this alien here, Xylene, and they have quite the history together. Thanks for your brave ventures, Space Cadet. Great, now I just want to play Mass Effect again. We still get our fair share of excitement around here. Ben's cousin Gwen Tennyson can be just as childish as Ben, but also just as mature as Grandpa Max. She serves as a more mature voice of reason and intelligence in comparison, and that is something that doesn't change over all of the series, even when her limits are tested by Ben severely. She's technologically savvy and is also very familiar with martial arts and gymnastics. What can't she do? Her quick thinking and adaptation allows her to fight really well, but the original series seems to struggle with finding Gwen's place in the fights they run into at least at first. Despite her small stature and young age, she manages to get involved with fights just as much as her large grandpa and superpowered cousin. But as the battles become more and more intense, it's clear that she needs a bit more to work with like magic. No, for real. The first two seasons, she goes back and forth between superpowered and not, with both the Lucky Girl arc, where she acquires a lucky charm and uses it to fight crime, and also with her being able to wear the Omnitrix to fight Vilgax. Only on one occasion, though. In the third season, she and the witch charm caster, apprentice to the master magician Hex, have a Freaky Friday moment where they switch bodies, unlocking the magical abilities in Gwen's body, since she is already predisposed to it because of her already existing magical aura. Why? Because why not, I guess. These characters serve more as direct villains for Gwen to deal with, giving Ben a slight break from the direct conflict. I think overall giving Gwen some more importance in the story and fighting scenarios was something that needed to be done. The show didn't want to leave this third member of the team without something to do in moments that would have her literally doing nothing. I think that more magical powers in contrast to the alien abilities or the more strength and gadget based stuff is a smart choice mixed with her smarts. It's a winning combination and I like that Gwen gets to feel more helpful and less like a tag along. Other reoccurring villains include a young boy named Kevin E. Levin. Yeah, Kevin Eleven. Y you see what they did there? But you know what's an even funnier easter egg about Kevin Eleven here? Well, the episode that he debuts in happens to be the seventh episode. Seven... Eleven. He is introduced as a young delinquent living a life of crime on the streets. Due to his supernatural abilities to absorb energy and power, he gets to explore the variety of his abilities when he meets young Ben, and he absorbs a lot of information from the watch, turning him into something that isn't quite human anymore, fueling his hatred towards Ben for, in a way, cursing him. In the classic series, he serves as the main reoccurring villain, and plays a role as representation of what Ben could be if he chooses to be selfish with his powers. But despite this, Kevin is always extended extended an open hand by the Tennyson family in hopes that he will make a recovery and choose to stop using his powers for selfish, violent gain. Going on to have very intriguing, thought-provoking, and well-written storylines thanks to him being a staple character in the sequel series. And I really like the initial time he is introduced, specifically when Ben dealing with himself and his internal struggles of who he is, what he can do and can't do with his own powers, all while Kevin is being this guide to destruction, nearly wanting to kill a bunch of train passengers, but of course, Ben snaps back to reality and the gravity of the situation hits him. While he does what's right, he has still disappointed Grandpa Max and breaks the trust in him. It's a good lesson, one that kind of just fades away rather than dealing with these consequences of his actions, but a good showcase of what doing wrong can bring upon oneself and those around you. 
so like the main thing about this show is that Ben can use his watch to turn into a bunch of different aliens. And fun fact, one of the contenders for the Omnitrix's name in the series pre-production was the Mega Deoxyribonucleic Transdimensional Transforminal Numerator. Now that's a name, but let's name and take a look at all the different aliens Ben can become. The 10 aliens that Ben is originally able to transform into are Heat Blast, the first alien we meet that has the fire powers. Wild Mutt, basically a giant furry dog mouth with legs, and although he has no nose, sure has a great sense of smell. Diamond Head, a very large crystalline alien that can grow and regenerate extremely durable green crystals. XLR8, like Accelerate, is a super speedy aerodynamic alien with wheels for feet. Gray Matter, the smallest of them all physically, but the one with the biggest brain, and we find out why later. Forearms, which seems to be Ben's go-to as one of the largest and strongest aliens who is super strong. He has four arms. What are you, a red machamp? What's the deal with Ben? Stinkfly is a stinky fly that has the main power of flight, great range of vision, and the power of spitting goo. Ripjaws is another really strong one, but he's really strong in the water, so he can breathe in water and swim really fast. Upgrade is made of nanites that can change their size, altering his body shape and type, and also has these tech powers which allow him to merge or possess any alien tech, which is a niche power, but it comes in handy more than you'd think. Lastly, the Ghost Freak is this ghost ghost-like creature that has a lot of traditional ghost-like abilities, such as phasing through solid objects, invisibility, and possession, just to name a few. And ugh, I'm still upset about the Bancraft Academy breakup. Team Ben all the way. Ghost Freak's alien race of DNA can contain a full life with just a few particles. Ghost Freak was different from all the other aliens in the watch. He was a full-on alien and there was always this weird aura around Ghost Freak that unsettled Ben before we get to this reveal. The Omnitrix is full of alien DNA that Ben can turn into, but it's not the aliens themselves. It's still Ben, but his molecules get all rearranged to become the different alien races for a limited time. So the reveal with Ghost Freak was a really cool way to explore some lore about another alien race. These aliens had quickly become the most memorable and nostalgia-driven characters, even warranting guest appearances, full-on mainstays and references, and various other continuations of the series. Although the watch can only have 10 species accessible at a time, at least it's supposed to, when the the need arises for the watch to be reset, the watch swaps out the 10 for a new 10 species, sometimes repeating and sometimes introducing completely new ones. In the original series, we even see that the watch gets a taste of alien DNA while coming into contact with attackers of different species, and learn from the DNA how to transform its wear genetically into a specific species. Wow, I guess Ben does have Kevin Eleven's powers in a way. And while I appreciate an entire universe of unique and fresh alien species that we are allowed to explore, there could be a hundred more. Part of me craves the consistency of having just the original 10. And yes, my therapist did say I'm afraid of change, but that has nothing to do with this and I have a perfectly normal relationship with change. On one hand, when we get new aliens, we run the risk of getting another blocks equivalent. But on the other hand, we can sell more toys. Yeah, the Lego market is in shambles. You know, I don't even hate blocks. He reminds me of this one Blockman Yu-Gi-Oh card, or even like Toy Agumon from Dingy. <laughs> For real though, it actually is fun to explore just a small fraction of the hundreds of thousands of alien species in both our galaxy and even our neighboring one that the Omnitrix is able to study and log. It also leaves so much room to explore in in the future. In the rest of the original series, we are introduced to Cannonbolt, a big boy with a broad, armor-plated body. He has speed strength and can transform into a sphere, like a roly-poly. Wildvine, who can control plans, has explosive fruit, and can regenerate like you've never seen. Spitter, who spits a lot and can inflate like a pufferfish. Buzzshock, who can control electricity and technology as well as absorb and redirect it. Arctiguana is like an iguana, but instead of being hot in hot places, he's cold in cold places. He can fight with ice rays and he can't freeze himself. That's helpful. Blitzwolfer, which is more like a werewolf with enhanced agility, strength, howling, and speed, among many other abilities. Snaro is a mummy like elastic alien that can shape shift, regenerate, and fight with his wrappings. Frankenstrike is an alien based off Frankenstein's monster. Along with being super strong, he can also utilize electro and technokinesis. Upchuck is the CEO of Mom, I threw up. Ditto, not the Pokemon, can duplicate himself. I got is a bat thing with eyes on his body. It scares me, but I'm cool with it. Lastly, there's Way Big, who is 
way big, but we will talk about him soon. And then if we really want to be detailed, there's three other, or I guess six other aliens we can talk about here for Ben. In the episode Dr. Animo and the Mutant Ray, the Omnitrix is having issues like it always does, and Ben's definitely not helping the situation here. But throughout this episode, we get to see some uh, mistake DNA mixing together. Like this. This is Stink Arms, which is four arms and stink fly. Ooh, but don't forget about Diamond Matter, which is Diamond Head and Gray Matter. I think that's self-explanatory. And Heat Jaws. I'll give you five seconds to just take a guess at which two are put together. I think this is a cool concept that they could have explored definitely a little bit further on, if not just for like more fun gags. But there's just something about stink arms. I just, I can't look at them. I think I'm just more offended at the name though. Diamond Matter, however, that's one cool dude. The Omnimatrix is really its own character throughout the show, based on it rarely doing what Ben wants it to do. It will constantly shoot out the wrong alien Ben was expecting, making the situations being solved a tougher feat for Ben. On top of this, why not make it more hard with its parental controls? Every time he uses the watch, he has a 10 minute time limit to be any of the aliens before it shuts off, and then it starts a 10 minute cooldown time where he's all on his own as just a 10 year old kid. But it does make these moments moments a lot more tense and exciting to see how Ben and company get out of these problems when he can't turn into a, a diamond. Man, that's rough. He does accidentally unlock the master controls to the Omnitrex in the finale of the second season, allowing him to fully transform and control the alien forms by just thinking it, but it gets undone when he sacrifices it to Vilgax and Kevin in an effort to save Gwen from their clutches. Ouch. As far as the way the aliens look, heck, in general, all of the alien characters outside of Ben's lot of them are all really cool looking. Knowing where the concept art was at to where the final designs got to, it's really nice to see the evolution and fleshing out of these characters. Rather than keeping them humanoid, they feel more otherworldly and unique with their designs, making sense for the things that they can do. Vilgax looks awesome and only continues to look awesome as the other series come out, so it always feels like his character is evolving or changing based on each interaction he has with Ben. There's so much personality and flair to every little bit of the characters and the world of Ben 10 feels like it grows with it, lore-wise. The whole plumber secret organization for Grandpa Max opens the world of Ben 10 into a whole other level of sci-fi layered goodness. This whole intergalactic alien battling business didn't start with Ben. He's just our vessel into this bigger picture. The Plumbers are an intergalactic police force that deal in space justice. I love saying space justice. This space justice is carried out with wickedly neat design gadgets that are ready to take on anything threatening the universe. This bit of lore is a huge part of what makes the future set of series so much more interesting than just the surface level alien fighting action. The early bit of the show, mainly season one and some of season two, really are just establishing what in the Omnitrix is happening here. But for the remainder of the seasons, we spend time opening up what was previously established. It does feel like quite a bit at a certain point. I have to pull out the whiteboard to keep up with the narrative once we start getting into some of the more in-depth sci-fi elements, especially when they create a timeline that feels necessary yet unimportant at parts. Let's look at the Ben 10,000 episode, where a future version of Gwen comes back to the past to get her and Ben to aid the dubbed hero of heroes, Ben 10,000. A future version of Ben that one, has more abilities, and two, has let the ego we've seen the young Ben have get to his head. From the way he still treats people in his life to, um, I don't know, the giant statue proclaiming that he's this larger than life hero. Through this future narrative though, we get to a point where future Ben comes around to being a better person to the people in his life, just like that, which in turn aids Ben in realizing that he can be a jerk to others as well. I mean, he found his own self 20 years in the future to be a jerk. That's gotta mean something to you. When Ben is back in the past, we see how he starts to understand and care for others, but the problem with this show is that the lessons being taught, which are pretty blatant at the start of every episode, as to which lesson Ben is going to learn, is that he rarely, if never, grows from them. Oh, what makes all of this more complicated for the Ben 10 timeline, like I alluded to earlier, is that this and another episode, Ken 10, are both an alternate future. There is a Ben all grown up in the future, but these two episodes are not the same future as that future, if that makes sense. It's like a multiverse, and that is totally the first time you've heard the word multiverse, right? This Ben 10,000 universe is dubbed the original timeline, where Ben is a superhero which branched away from the main or prime timeline, 
to become its own little possibility of what could have been. The main timeline is where the true canon lies, containing the full events of Ben 10, Alien Force, Ultimate Alien, and Omniverse. So that's fun. But that Ken 10 episode is really cool though, and I don't want to just dismiss it because it's technically not canon. In it, we focus on Ben 10,000's son, Ken 10, who is gifted the starter Omnitrex with the whole limiter thing once again with 10 aliens on it for his 10th birthday. But Ken feels ready for more and wants to be in on the action to help save the day, like Ben did when he was his age. We also get to meet Devlin, who turns out to be Kevin 11's son, and through some devious trickery, he gets Ken to release his father from the void, and also he can look just like the mutated version of Kevin 11. Yep, that's Devlin 11. That is Kevin 11. Are you keeping up? Doesn't matter. This episode doesn't technically matter. But what makes this episode so strong is seeing how far off the deep end Kevin 11 has gone, and how he treats his own son as nothing more than a useless pawn. Leading Devlin to realize the monster his father has become, and now having no family because of it. But Ben 10,000 ends up offering to take him in as part of the family, making sure that he has people around him that care about him, and are helping to make sure that he doesn't become like his father. What a beautiful episode. That doesn't matter to the story of Ben 10 whatsoever, but hey, it's still good TV. But the whole show was good TV. Ben 10 has been nominated and has won a multitude of awards, including Emmys, Annies, voice acting, sound editing, and writing awards. Its accolades could literally fill three pages of research. And I know, I filled three pages of research with it. Mainly, the voice actors are highly awarded and I totally see why, because the voice acting is really good for the majority of the franchise. Of course, we have Tara Strong voicing young Ben Tennyson in the original series, as well as whenever the younger version of Ben shows up in future media which happens a lot. Gwen's voice is provided by Megan Smith, and Grandpa Max is voiced by Paul Eating. Now, for the end of the original Ben 10, we were given a movie, and for me personally, I consider it more of a special since it is also split up into a few episodes, so it's debatable if you consider it a movie or if I consider it a special. There are some many split multi-story episodes, and I think it just fits in with how the series went. Oh, but Jordan, the cover says movie! Eh, semantics. But Ben 10's Secret of the Omnitrix would wrap everything everything up so far and open up the future of where Ben 10 is heading. It's weird because this movie, or special or whatever, premiered during Ben 10 week before the remaining eight episodes of the fourth season. But it is the official ending to the series, taking place after the episode that would premiere seven months after the series finale came out, because why not make everything else more confusing? Oh, sorry about that, sport. You got 10 minutes, Gramps. My turn! In August of 2007, the TV movie Ben 10 Secret of the Omnitrix was aired on Cartoon Network. In this movie, we learn a lot about the device that the original show didn't deeply dive into. After the Omnitrix has an issue, shocker, Tetrix returns to Ben to investigate the watch as he has received a signal that the watch started its SDM function. Oh yeah, that stands for self-destruct mode. And this urgency is amplified when it has the power to destroy the universe. Okay, the stakes have risen, that's great. Well, not for the universe, but for my entertainment, that's great. From there, we go on an adventure to meet the maker of the Omnitrix, Azmuth, a member of the Galvan race, the same race as Grey Matter. The watch serves as a genetic library with records of different species from all around the galaxy. One of the main arguments of Azmuth is that it was created as a way of understanding different species by walking a mile in their shoes. His original intention was not to introduce an all-powerful weapon, but to create something that would instigate peace, understanding, and empathy to the world that is riddled with misunderstanding and judgment. This is actually a really interesting concept that isn't fully explored. We can tell that Azimuth is some kind of super mega genius, so much so that he is able to create a powerful, sleek, and genetically modifying device, and rarely have his technology recreated by others, so it must have been extremely important for him to want to dedicate his life to creating the Omnitrix. But in all this, you just can't help but wonder, if you had the brains and the technology to make something as powerful as the Omnitrix, I think there's a problem with a big overlooked factor of this being turned out and used as a weapon. Because whether you're fighting for good, or or bad, it's clear that a big aspect of this watch has an ability where it can be weaponized. A 10 year old kid can wield it and use its abilities instantly. Imagine if it were someone more dastardly it got into the hands of. So again, you'd think some super genius inventor would have been able to predict that or even speculate its practical use. I'm not trying to be judgy or whatever, but you'd also think that any good inventor would at least think about the consequences of these things they're inventing. My man discovered a way to genetically change people on a cellular level and didn't expect a more 
grim outcome? Ridiculous. Nah, for real, I like this fella. Another reason for creating the Omnitrix, which personally is the most compelling reason, is so that they could store the library of DNA and repopulate should any of the species go extinct. A sci-fi concept explored many times before in other media that would make sense. On the topic of weaponizing things, we land on our main inter-series antagonist and Ben's archenemy, the tentacly terrifying Vilgax. Who saw that coming? Vilgax, as we know, was very early on established to be the most terrifying and fearsome of villains that Ben will have to face again and again. But throughout the franchise, we get to see Ben get stronger, defeat Vilgax in many various powerful forms, he is acknowledged as a well-known intergalactic warlord conqueror who is actually the reason that Ben found the watch in the first place. An old lover, I mean partner of Max's, Xylene, was transporting the watch when Vilgax attacked her and she was forced to send the Omnitrix off of her ship and target it towards Earth for safety. Initially intending to send it straight to Max Tennyson's coordinates, she is slightly off and it lands nearby in the forest where Ben finds it. She explains that his DNA was close enough to Max's that the watch attached itself to him and all the rest is history. Which is such a big reveal that ties in so much back to the start of the show, finally getting some of those answers to fill in the gaps. Ben was never supposed to be a part of this at all. He just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, or the right place at the right time, depending on how you want to look at it. As an end to the cartoon side of things for the series, this was genuinely exciting, action-packed, and hit heavy with lore giving you enough to feel satisfied, and so much to patiently wait for what the future holds for Ben 10. It has some good emotional beats and maybe, just maybe, the lessons he learns he can actually retain. Sometimes you have to see the good in people and not just be a selfish jerk. But I doubt that. This double fringe miss is brought to you by Gamer Subs. Hey. Hey, you heard of Gamer Subs? Yeah. Did you know it's less than one calorie per serving? Yeah. Did you know that it's sugar free? Yeah. Did you know if you use code Fringe, you get 10% off your order? Yeah. Wait, really? Yeah. Just go to Gamer Subs, use code Fringe, get 10% off. Sick. Are you going to go to Gamer Subs and use code Fringe for 10% off? Yeah. You know it helps support the channel, right? Yeah. Do you know that you're really cute? Huh? We did get to meet a new alien, this giant race known as the Toka Star, or as we already know him as, Way Big. I'm not just big. I'm way big! How perceptive. But in the same year Secret of the Omnitrix was released, just a few months later, another Ben 10 movie was released, this time taking a step out of the comfort zone of animation and into the live action storytelling format. Race Against Time was the first of the two live action iterations for the franchise. It was released on November 21st, 2007 and picks up where the original series left off with Ben having to transition from his life in the summer that revolved around, you know, saving the world to his boring and socially delicate life at school. His frustration mainly stems from being the center of the focus in the galaxy to being a wedgie receiver and overall weird invisible kid. And we kind of feel for him. He's still a jerk, but like one you feel sorry for sometimes, you know? But this does mean we get get a peek at his life with a secondary identity, which was a trope that I loved as a kid. He's like the Hannah Montana of alien crime fighting, but not a superstar. His parents also aren't much help in his life socially, and if anything, add more social pressure to him. After his first day back at school, he gets in trouble when he attempts to throw a piece of gum-covered paper at his bullies, and instead hits the principal. And because of this, his parents try to have a talk with him over dinner about, I don't know, being normal? And it morphs into suggesting he makes some more friends his age. Like, geez. Sandra and Carl. You sat down to talk to your son about his behavioral problems stemming from being bullied by everyone his age and you transitioned the conversation into making more friends his age? A plus parenting right there. It's evident right off the bat how alienated Ben feels in his own home. He even lies to them about being in the school talent show with Gwen to quell their suspicions about his recent world saving antics. With their non-traditional parenting styles and tofu filled dinners, Ben finds that he doesn't belong at home or at school, but instead the rust bucket, which is later are brutally blown up. Honestly, with the screen time they gave this explosion, and with a smaller budget of five million, I just know they blew so much of their budget on it. We also get to see an official plumber facility underneath Bellwood, and meet some of the few aging plumbers that are left. It seems that every person in their 60s and 70s in Bellwood is a plumber, like Ben's principal, the fire chief, even the waitress at the cafe that Ben frequents, and completely trashes to punish his bullies. That's just disrespectful. Portrayed by Graham Phillips, Ben is actually very much in character compared to his cartoon self. It could be just 
just thanks to good casting and or good writing, but most of the cast is really loyal to their characters. Maybe Grandpa Max is a bit different in tonal delivery and attitude just a bit, but it still translates fairly well. Although the acting may not be winning any Oscars anytime soon, the feeling of Ben 10 was captured well. Throwing in a very cheesy feel with a mixed quality of special effects, it translated to a fun venture. And because of that, I'll basically let it get away with anything. Well, almost anything. Explain yourself for this! Played by Haley Ram, Gwen is Ben's only friend at school. They still poke fun at each other like they do in the cartoons, but this movie was really important in establishing the strength of their bond as family. But they always find a way to go right back to their old antics. Grandpa Max is played by Lee Majors, the six million dollar man. He's actually really funny and very quickly becomes one of the most likable characters in this movie. I think most of this specifically comes from where Lee and the writers took the character, giving Lee more freedom to add a little pizzazz. The evil villain in the story is Eon, played by Christine Anholt. He's an older alternate timeline version of Ben himself and also a member of an alien time-traveling race that wants to take over young Ben's Omnitrix so that he could become a younger, more powerful form of himself in order to bring his race to take over Earth in an alien invasion. Did you get all that? because it sure took me a hot minute to wrap my head around. Look at this whiteboard. While Eon doesn't go into any specifics, he does say that his race were all powerful and learned to control time itself. And that's why he can do this at the start of the movie. He's dead. Ben just murdered someone. His whole plan requires using the hands of Armageddon, a device that would open a gateway to his home so his race can come through. Through this, we meet Constantine Jacobs, or what's left of him, as he exposition dumps a bunch of information for the audience to know, more so than the characters. It's really just to tell us what's happening, because I don't know what's happening. Look at the whiteboard. Luckily, it's delivered well and adds to the cheesier tone. <sighs> And he's dead now. Alive any longer and he would have started remembering when they first Sweet invented chocolate. chocolate. We get to see the time warping abilities and action from Eon and we also finally get to see this happen. <laughs> Nice. Eon does the big reveal of who he is as this older evil version of Ben from a different universe. He gets his DNA into Ben's Omnitrex and leaves knowing his mission is done. So Ben now turns into Eon and is evil and British. Sorry to disappoint you. Gwen ends up using her leveled up speech ability to find the old Ben inside of Eon and it ends up working, stopping the plan Eon set up, which means he needs to come back. There needs to be a fight. And don't worry, there is. Anyway, in the end, Eon fails. Big surprise, he gets blown up again. <laughs> Nice. And they're all able to make it out alive. Except for Constantine. <sighs> they even still make it in time for their act at the talent show. You can't miss that. Where Ben uses his transformation from Wild Mutt back to himself as the magic act. We get the satisfaction of the bullies acknowledging that Ben is friends with Wild Mutt. And I guess who wouldn't want to be friends with a giant eyeless big mouth dog alien thing? Me. I, I would not want I would not want that. The movie was directed by Alex Winter, or Bill from Bill and Ted, who actually makes an appearance in the film as the dying time-ridden corpse, aka the one and only Constantine Jacobs. Heck yeah. Anyway, Winter is really open about his young son being a fan of the cartoon and having some sort of involvement with the production. He even says that he would help him and correct him on some occasions as to what he should or shouldn't do in certain circumstances. And I think that is pretty cool coming from the kid's perspective. This movie, while not being the most aesthetically pleasing, high production value, has a great charm to it. It doesn't feel far removed from the series, which could have potentially been thanks to Winter being so open to his son and his son's friend's criticisms, but it just has a great tone to it in general. While cartoons can get away with lightening its heavier themes due to it being a cartoon, this is something that a lot of live action versions of cartoons can't quite nail. But this live action movie doesn't allow the transition to feel too jarring because it doesn't try too hard. It didn't need to be more than it was. This movie feels more akin to a Shark Boy and Lava Girl or the Spy Kids franchise. I actually loved watching this movie and appreciated it for the blurry shots. Some sometimes off-putting CGI, and the obviously poorly disguised Baron Warner Bros. set lots. And not to mention its blatant disregard for property damage. And do you know what all this movie means? It means that the last premiered episode of Ben 10 that came out in April of 2008, after both Secret of the Omnitrix and Race Against Time, Goodbye and Good Riddance, is another episode that is non-canon. While this time it's less of another timeline and more of a Marvel-style what-if that focuses on Ben going back to school and dealing with not showing off to his classmates who bully him, him, that he could become a cool, strong alien, just like the live action movie, which was the direct sequel to The Secret of the Omnitrix. <sighs> Are you confused yet? No? 
Yes, whatever you answered, it's one giant web of so much to follow. There was also the Gwen 10 episode that fits the what if side of things, but I promise Ben 10 is comprehensible. More so nowadays rather than back when it was premiering, but at least we can look back properly now. Ben 10 as a whole loves to retcon, going back and confirming or denying things that are and aren't canon. Oh yeah, by the way, Race Against Time is no longer canon. So this story about his return to school and the other story about his return to school are both not canon. None of that mattered. But we're not out of the woods yet with Ben 10. Despite the series going on from this point to age Ben 10 up, which we will cover in the next part of our Ben 10 series retrospective, there was another ride we would have to take in the RV, this time in another new style, 3D animation. This is all a computer simulation. Destroy All Aliens is the next big entry for the younger Ben 10 saga. Even though it would come out all the way in 2012, which is an odd place to see as we were already deep into the older Ben storyline, the original storyline apparently just wasn't over. Because the real ending to Ben before he grows up shows him one year later as now he's 11. It shows us right off the bat how this post road trip trio dynamic still finds the time to fight back against the evil doers, spending their nights out on the streets doing so. The story starts off with Gwen, Ben, and Matt fighting against a giant robotic tank. How did she survive that? And how did they survive that? During a dispute between the two cousins, Gwen uses her magic to dismantle the tank while Ben is currently encasing it with upgrade. This results in the Omnitrix malfunctioning, which seems to just be the overall theme of Ben 10. I swear, this happens more often than my upload frequency. Ben has this whole nightmare sequence where he is being attacked by the aliens he can turn into and for some reason is missing the Omnitrix on his arm in a few shots. Huh. Weird. Anyways, Tetrax is back to see Ben and needed him so that he and Ben can meet up with Azmuth. But Ben's impatient, chucks up the deuces and crashes into a truck that contained the blue version of Waybig. Uh, but this one's... That truck he hit was important, but we'll find out why later. Ben absorbs the blue giant and the day is saved, I guess? Gwen and Grandpa Max are trying to locate where Ben went and this breaks canon as well. Gwen doesn't use this locating power for the first time until Alien Force, but this is Ben 10 and it's okay to be confused, I think. Let's check in on that whiteboard one more time. Okay, we're making progress. Ben falls from the sky after Tetrick's ship gets a hole blown in it, making him land at Stonehenge. Then this galvanic mechamorph shows up, but here's the fun part of this battle. Battle, we start going from Stonehenge to Rio de Janeiro and to Egypt to a city. Okay, yeah, so that truck from earlier, well, that was Azmuth, and this bad guy is just Azmuth's dad who thought his son was killed, and there's this giant evil Waybig, so then he needed to go and locate him or fight anything in his way. But the evil Waybig was just Azmuth the whole time. Spoiler alert, I'm sorry. The Omnitrix ends up swallowing them all inside of it during this confrontation that leads to all of them working together to fight the evil Waybig, but this battle breaks free of the Omnitrix, and while the evil Way big or Toka Star, sorry, I'm just used to calling him Way Big, continues on a rampage through the city. The Omnitrex somehow turns his own parents into some of his aliens. The group here finally puts two and two together and discovers that the giant blue evil Way Big is Azmuth. Now we get this awesome kaiju battle between two Way Bigs here, which just look like Ultraman in a variant color option from Super Smash Bros. They are able to convince Azmuth's father after a while not to attack his own disguised son here because he's still 100% convinced that this thing killed his son. Gwen's magic, however, is able to get through to Asmus' mind enough for him to fix the Omnitrix, with everyone all transforming back to their original selves. Oh, and his parents all get turned back eventually, but it would be an interesting family dinner if they didn't. Asmuth tells Ben that he could pick up the readings from the overload of mana inside the watch from all the way across the galaxy, and he needed to come fix the watch. The majority of the same voice cast as the original series returned for this TV movie, which was a really great thing to see. The 3D animation was pretty good. There was a lot of texture and models that translated really well into 3D, especially Ben and Gwen themselves with how animated their facial expressions were. Although it is annoying that the name of the movie is Destroy All Aliens when it's said once in a violent rage when his father tries to attack all of them. I will destroy all aliens! 
Other than that, it doesn't seem to be a really well-connected theme. Also, while the animation is great, they do constantly fight in an urban city setting, which seems to be abandoned because there is literally no people or cars around, aside from that opening scene. But I'm glad there weren't, because if there were, they would all die because of the falling buildings. A classic Ben 10 move, destroying people's livelihoods and homes. No, seriously, this was my biggest problem with the movie. It just felt way too destructive and way too empty. But other than those two things, the movie is a nice little re-exploration and nod to the original series and its canon, while also alluding to a few things that are revealed in Alien Force like the concept of mana and more, despite a few things continuity-wise not adding up. Oh boy, would you look at the RV right there? I mean, it's just completely... <laughs> Even one of the Ben 10 shorts that came out was in direct relation to this film and came out years after the original show to release the same year as the movie. To say Ben 10 didn't have a major impact is just being a liar, and I don't like liars. The success of Ben 10 is not to be understated, because all we've done is talk about the cartoon. What about the merchandise? Good question! but also a stupid one. You know good and well there's merch. A lot of merch. Originally handled by Bandai and later Playmats Toys for the reboot series, the toys were the massive money maker. Action figures either make you or break you, and Ben 10 was made with them. The fact you could just buy this was enough to make every viewer of the show lose their collective minds. Legos, sure, definitely got them. McDonald's tie-in toys, of course. Comic books, clothes, trading cards, video games, and so much more all add up for the franchise being worth around eight billion dollars. That's billions with a B. The B stands for Ben. Ben 10. As far as the video games by themselves, there were quite a bit, but let's mention the ones that correspond with the other Ben 10 series when we get to them. For now, that leaves us with the first game titled Ben 10 on the Hyperscan. Okay, while that is true, this obscure Mattel-made video game console was real and had the first Ben 10 game, it was a platformer and the whole gimmick of the console, not just the game in general, was similar to the e-reader for the Game Boy Advance, where you would buy booster packs of cards to scan or swipe into your game. So the small library that short-lived console had all had card packs related to the games. $20 for the game, $10 for the packs. While the concept for this physical to digital transfer has happened over and over again in different ways throughout gaming, from Amiibos to the e-reader cards and oh boy how about them Skylanders, it was still pretty cool albeit clearly a major cash grab. But the console flopped and it was discontinued very quickly. The other Ben 10 game was on more accessible consoles like the PS2, PSP, the Wii, and the DS. Ben 10 Protector of Earth, developed by High Voltage Software, the creators of too many sports games. In the game, you play as Ben, who can use his Omnitrex abilities to become his classic group of aliens to solve puzzles, navigate the different regions, and take down bad guys in combat. Early in the game, you are limited to some aliens, but gradually unlock the rest of them and even get the master controls unlocked to no longer have cooldown times for the aliens. Your main goal is to blow up and act like you don't know no but- Your main goal is to go and recover Omnitrex DNA samples that Vilgax has stolen before he destroys the world. The game wasn't too hard but offered fans of the show their first chance at controlling these aliens for themselves. Overall it received middling to slightly positive reviews so not too bad for this big jump to the video game world. By the way, I have a new channel I'm starting up soon called Fringe Gaming. If you like the content on this channel and you you'd like to see that in the video game world, check out that channel as I plan on releasing content there very soon. Oh, uh, by the way, did you know that Ben 10 had a game show? Yeah, Ben 10 was so big that Cartoon Network created a competitive game show all around Ben 10. Where's the Pokemon game show? I don't see one, but I do see one for Ben 10, so that's saying something. Here's the part where someone in the comments hits me with the, well, there was a Pokemon competitive game, and eh, I don't wanna hear it. And you know what? As much of a Pokemon fan as I am, today we are here for Ben 10, and by golly, Ben 10 is what you're gonna get. Starting in the United Kingdom in October of 2011, Ben 10 Ultimate Challenge, produced by 2020, a British production company, would premiere. A total of 12 episodes lasting the average runtime of 22 minutes were ordered from Cartoon Network, where in which it consisted of 36 contestants faced against 13 mind-bending challenges to test their hero skills and knowledge, just to see who was the top Ben 10 fan. It was even called the toughest game show on earth. The toughest game show on earth. See, he also said it, so I, I'm not making that up. I personally would have gone with the toughest game show in the universe, but hey, 
that's just me. Their forward thinking, however, on this idea led to mass syndication ASAP to 12 other regions outside of the UK, showcasing every region in various languages, getting in on the challenge. Salut et bienvenue dans Ben 10 Ultimate Challenge. I understood none of that. But hey, they even had an app full of extra online activities and ways to be involved with the challenge itself, for all the highlights and much more. You could win anything from an Xbox to an iPod Touch to a TV, but the coolest, like, like no joke here, coolest prize was exclusive animation cells from Ben 10 Ultimate Alien, which is pretty freaking cool. I don't know if a kid would appreciate that, but I think that's cool. And then one day, this show ended. It seemed like a decent sized budget for the sets as well as accounting for each of the regions set up for the show. So the only logical thing for them left to do was just to move on from this, right? Well, yeah, they did. But out of nowhere, in 2017, not super long into the new reboot of the Ben 10 series, a new version of the show would premiere titled Ben 10 Challenge. I guess Ultimate was too much for the players. Here, a kid would be asked trivia-related questions regarding Ben 10, as another kid was digitally collecting aliens in a timed manner, in order to get more questions for their team. Three, two, one, collect those aliens. All while their parent or guardian were hoisted up on some sort of bungee contraption, with the risk of being lifted up in the air. So for wrong answers, you just get to see the torture your adult teammate would face. But that was just the first one I watched, the first game I was introduced to. There's multiple different games that they play, multiple different rounds. But half the time, I didn't know what was happening in this version. But there is a reason for that. This version of the game show was so fast paced, just like the reboot of Ben 10, the host here would give no breaks in between each of the actions happening. Collect those aliens! It felt bite sized and it worked well to keep your attention, however. And of course, there had to be some sort of prize here too. Even second place would get some extra prizes as well. But the winning prizes would be the new Ben 10 video game and some brand new. Ben 10 toys. Sorry, Timmy, you ain't getting 10 grand on this show. You're getting this figure of Omni Not Armor Heat Blast. Now scram. And like I said, they played other games that always seemed to put the adult in peril. And just look at this mom's face. I can just tell she's a big fan of Ben 10 and is so happy to be here for her little champions. I have no sympathy. Oh, all right. Well, I, I wish her the best. Hey, you know, keep staying dry because I don't think you have anything to worry about. These kids can't hit for sh Okay, well, remind me to never have children. For real though, I like Nigel here. He's an energetic host with good charisma with a nice smile to boot. Just don't forget, collect those aliens. aliens. Lasting a total of five episodes as well as being in different regions, it was a fun little game show with some softball-esque questions, all in good fun for the kids to have the time of their lives at that moment. I can easily see a show like this being possible again during whatever the next iteration of Ben 10 is following the end of the reboot series back in 2021. Collect those Aliens. The biggest win Ben 10 gets from all of this, aside from all this money it's made the network, is that the show went on from the original series to become so much more. But there was a big decision to make when continuing the series. A mix of adapting with the current cartoon landscape and knowing when you've exhausted a premise. We've spent some good time at this point in Ben's life. This character isn't growing beyond the individual lessons that get reset in the next episode. Heck, we got a little throwback with the Destroy All Aliens movie, but we need to move forward. So they they pulled a Naruto Shippuden and time skipped. I've gone Ben 10 crazy myself. I've even purchased some vintage Ben 10 trading card booster packs, and I'm not gonna open them. Cartoon Network wanted to get some new ideas flowing into the world of Ben 10. Now adding Glenn Murakami, a veteran in the animation space who worked on shows like Teen Titans and Batman Beyond, who in turn hit up Dwayne McDuffie, a co-founder of Milestone Media, which gave birth to his work on stuff like Static Shot. Together, they were tasked with finding some ways to revamp the show, opting to mix the mysteries of the X files and the gang of problem solvers of Scooby-Doo into what Ben 10 could be. Fighting back against the network who wanted it to be a bit more toned down and poppy like the original series was. Both Glenn and Dwayne would work on Alien Force and Ultimate Alien, with Dwayne McDuffie sadly passing away before the completion of Ultimate Alien. Not only does the show itself feel a lot more serious here, but the story, lore, and character building ramp everything up to another level, building upon the things within the series that definitely needed some work. So as we explore the series of Ben 10 being older, we get a look at the bigger picture. How big is the scope of Ben 10? 
The original Ben 10 set the initial benchmark as a staple cartoon for Cartoon Network, finishing its run of four seasons in April of 2008. Continuing to adapt with the times, a thing that Ben 10 shows a consistent track record of doing between different show iterations, made a major jump from the end of the original series to Alien Force, premiering directly after the original ended. Alien Force would start the run of the older version of Ben himself in April of 2008 as well. A bold move, but a smart one to keep the fans interested and engaged in the franchise, essentially saying that, hey, we know you like this, but this just ended, so here is more of what you like, just a slightly older Ben and friends being at the forefront. Why this worked when it did is that it aged with the initial fans of the show. You're growing up in real life, and through the passage of time, Ben is growing up as well. Rather than being 10, Ben is now 15, and now has to deal with more complicated problems with a more mature mindset. Uh, kind of. I mean, it's still Ben, after all, but at least there was a noticeable character difference between those crucial five years in his life we skipped through. A little bit of something familiar, a little bit of something fresh. So Ben 10 Alien Force, the second Ben 10 series, returns us back into Ben's mid-teenage life along with Gwen. The only difference here is that they are not heroes anymore. These ex-heroes turned normies now go about their day-to-day -day living through their lives as regular teens would, dealing with everyday situations like school. But this is Ben 10, and if we wanted to watch a show about teens dealing with school drama, you could literally watch anything else. The family drama is why we are all here though starting with the information that Grandpa Max has gone missing, setting up a return to the hero life for Ben and Gwen through uncovering the mysterious alien conspiracy of the DN aliens. That's literally the coolest name ever. The DN aliens are these fusion of host bodies that are forcefully taken over by Xenocytes, a manufactured creature made by one of the first known species in the universe, the hybrids, as a way to transform the vessel they take over into what is known as a DN alien, very much acting like a parasite giving the breed an army of servant soldiers that have no say in the matter of what they're doing or are now a part of, setting up one of the story's biggest threats right off the bat. We can speak further to this a little bit later on. While Grandpa Max is missing, he's still there in spirit thanks to his scattered out cryptic messages explaining that he's got everything handled. But do you really, Max? Do you really? But these messages only encourage Ben and Gwen to get back into the intergalactic field once again. We also see that Ben has retired the Omnitrix, giving him the chance to live a normal life for a bit and have an actual childhood that doesn't involve fighting aliens or turning into them. He does get caught off guard by a DNA alien, and with no watch upon his wrist, he's essentially powerless and properly fighting back to take this thing down, only winning this altercation by scaring the DNA alien off with a fire extinguisher. Ben then learns through the hologram of Max that the Omnitrix is with him as we get a split second look at the hologram turning into a DNA alien in which Ben doesn't take no of. But Ben knows that the Omnitrix is still with him and goes where he had it hid to make sure that he is the one who in fact does have it. Also, in that message from Max, he says he's going on to investigate the return of alien activity. Spoiler alert, when would that ever stop? Clearly things were still going on while Ben was busy at school and playing soccer, but regardless, Ben is conflicted with what this situation calls for in general. Now having the option of letting Max handle this on his own or finding the Omnitrix tricks in his room and putting it back on. It truly feels as if there has been this struggle, the normal life or the hero life. Being able to grow up, have relationships, build friendships, be with your family, or sacrifice a lot of those things to do in your heart what feels right versus what feels selfish. Even though he has no obligation to be Ben 10, he still sees the greater good in being this great protector. A sense of purpose that the mundane day-to-day -day living hasn't fully given him during his time away. We see this play out as he speaks with Gwen. Does Grandpa Max want him to put back on the Omnitrix or not? Should he do it or not? But a shadowy figure that has been watching Ben appears asking Ben for the Omnitrix, ready to get it at whatever cost it takes. So when Ben doesn't oblige, he attacks Ben. But just because Ben doesn't have any powers at the moment, it doesn't mean that they all can't fight back right here. Remember, from the original show, Gwen still has her magical abilities and is able to subdue this mysterious alien, in which we find out that his name is Magister Labrid who also happens to be a plumber himself. As a refresher, the plumbers are basically space law enforcement delivering space justice. Man. 
it really is just so fun to say that. Grandpa Max, for example, is part of the plumbers and is more integral to the overall story of Ben 10 than we would have expected from the older dude driving around an RV. Back to the confrontation though, Labrid ends up apologizing as it was all a misunderstanding thinking that Ben was a thief trying to steal the Omnitrix for himself. They all come to an agreement of working together to look for Max and Ben makes the ultimate decision to strap back on the Omnitrix once again becoming Ben 10. From the jump, this show clearly sets a tone that this iteration of Ben 10 isn't as light as the original series was. And that's not to say that the original series didn't have its more serious moments, it surely did, but there is just a different level of gravitas here that wasn't there before. Yeah, does Alien Force have lighter and goofier moments? For sure, but it never felt that the main focus of the show was ever deterred by it, adding a level of sincerity to who those characters are now. Ben is no longer 10. He has matured quite a bit. In some ways, he's still the same Ben, but in all the right ways to finally show actual character growth, something the original series struggled with in terms of dealing with consequences of actions or working as a team with those around him. He still struggles with that last part in Alien Force and even beyond in the following series, but he feels more open in general when it comes to any sort of team factor. It's my worst subject. Ben 10 Alien Force is coming up next. Like I mentioned, I love that we get some actual character growth in this series compared to the original. Aging with the characters was a smart move in order to mature not only the individuals, but the plot as well. Tara Strong, who originally voiced Ben, has passed the role on to Yuri Lowenthal, a choice that added some real weight to the voice of the character, giving a clear separation between Ben at 10 versus Ben at 15. Throughout the majority of Alien Force, Ben struggles with finding himself, his purpose, his reasonings, as he must become this larger than life galaxy to Fender while having a lack of direct guidance in his life. Having no Grandpa Max to help be this voice of reason and mentor figure, he has to learn to be this voice of reason for himself. Literally, but that explanation is coming later. He really just has this lack of confidence that in the original series he had, and that was more so thanks to his ego. Gwen, who was voiced by Megan Smith, is now voiced by Ashley Johnson, giving a similar effect like Ben. When Gwen was 10, she always came off way more mature in her actions compared to Ben, but still had her moments of being goofier and, you know, acting like a kid. But as Gwen grows up, the more serious and concise tonal dictation becomes the mainstay for her personality. This time around, her magical abilities have become another thing she is proficient in, much like martial arts in school. Kevin Eleven makes a return to the series. We last left him as this pseudo-villain figure that always felt like a misguided youth not sure of their life, making fight-or-flight decisions in order to get by, but with a twist of his absorption powers. In the original series, we don't get the satisfaction of his reformation. It's more of just making these changes during the start of Alien Force where he still deals with a darker side while trying to be something greater. And having a crush on Gwen is sure some real motivation. It's something that we get to see blossom as this series goes on. How they form a relationship that you wouldn't think makes sense until you really take a look under the hood. Gwen, you have to treat a car like you treat a woman. Go on. No, I sense I've made a mistake of some kind. Well, I never said he was a smooth talker. But what I mean about that previous statement is that they function as complete opposites, creating one whole part of two parts. Literally from episode one of Alien Force, this new version of Kevin immediately shows a change in how he treats people. After them all coming together during the stakeout Ben, Gwen, and Labrit are doing, where they witness an illegal deal containing alien tech between the Forever Knights, which we will speak about later on in this video, and their supplier of goods, who turns out to be Kevin. But when the deal gets interrupted by Labrid, surprise, surprise, the dealers of the weapons turn out to be DNA aliens themselves, causing a battle to take place where our heroes are surrounded. And Ben's watch doesn't work when it's hero time. Another big surprise there. Only instead of not giving him the right alien, it's just not working at all. Eventually, the watch finally does something, and by something, I mean transforms into a new sleek look that color matches Ben's outfit. Remember, fashion first, functionality second. He scrolls through his alien options like an all-you-can-eat buffet, but if all the food was something you've never seen before, because all of these aliens are brand new to the show. We meet our first new alien as Ben becomes Swampfire, an alien that bullets fly through, has fire powers, super strength, and can reattach limbs as they get cut off. Kevin steps in for a heaping dose of revenge on Ben for having him trapped in the void for so long off-screen, and uses his absorption powers to become full steel. Ben, however, still pretty 
pretty easily pushes him aside as the Forever Knights and Dean aliens finish the deal and make a getaway. Once our group here though has Kevin captured, they have a talk about how these classified, too powerful for Earth weapons even got here, and that they have to stop these knights from having them. Now, why would Kevin help in this? Kevin, people could be hurt. Oh, yeah, there it is. I know that look. Now, as they work together to get the weapons back, or for Kevin to get his money from the deal that he never got to collect in the end, we start seeing the team relationship dynamic here form. While driving in Kevin's green and black sick whip, we get our first bit of taste of who Kevin is now, and how he defends Gwen when Ben yells at her during the drive. You know, that good old fashioned cousin bickering is back. And Kevin literally pulls a I'm turning this car around and tells him to not speak to her like that. It really sets the tone for how we will see him from now on. Kevin's voice has shifted voice actors as well, from Charlie Schlatter to Greg Sipes, which helped in aiding this bad boy turned good, or morally gray may be the better term here. There's actually quite a lot of growing that Kevin does throughout this series and the next one, Ultimate Alien. The fact that he's the one to call Ben a jerk and have Ben agree and reflect on himself You're a jerk. I know. kinda says something in a way that they wanted to give the audience a swift reason to give Kevin a chance as a main character and see how he is different. Well, kind of different, he, he still has his moments. Once they are able to find where the DNA aliens went thanks to Gwen's ability of tracking people by using some random item they've come in contact with, they discover a secret base of DNA aliens working on things, as well as stuff. We get a look at Humongosaur, this hulking beast that can change size and can just beat the crap out of everything. Upon taking down this base and saving the day, the day is actually not saved because this was only one of many, many other bases setting up a grand journey for these three to go on. I say three because this guy, he dies. Ow. Giving Kevin his official plumber's badge, seeing the potential in Kevin doing something meaningful in his life, which in turn ends up being quite meaningful to Kevin, finally feeling like he has a real purpose to fight for. Man, the first two-part special really is the best way to build how these characters have changed and how they will grow going forward. The creators jam-packed this season opener with so many little instances like this. How can you not feel the weight on Ben's shoulders? Resonate with the concern Gwen has and open your heart for Kevin. An effective and impactful way of getting the audience on board from young Ben to teen Ben. The team dynamic between the three works as a balancing act, where each person adds a lot to the other. From Ben and Kevin growing and actual friendship out of an old rivalry, Kevin and Gwen developing romantic feelings for one another, and Gwen and Ben having an overall better relationship that isn't just consisting of fighting with one another. I feel like I'm watching a team that genuinely has a purpose for coming together and feel distinctly like their own well-written characters. The main setup plot that will take up two thirds of Alien Force sets our newly put together team against the odds, having to find out what happened to Grandpa Max. Where did he go and how did the DNA aliens play into the bigger picture? When dealing and taking down their bases, we see a pattern of weather machines shifting temperatures colder with a little bit of rain just for flair. They prefer a chiller climate, which may seem like just a thing that they're doing as a fun little quirky detail, but this plays into their further plans. Above the DNA aliens are the hybrids or better known as one of the oldest living species in the galaxy, and they are extremely prejudiced against any other species out there that isn't them. Technically, their race are known as the Adasians, but refer to themselves as hybrid based on where they see themselves in terms of importance over every other alien species. They have what they deem the purest form of DNA above all else. Like I mentioned, they send out these xenocytes that attach themselves to a host and mutate them into these mixed and morphed DNA aliens, and they can spit. Okay, but he do be spitting facts though. Underneath the gooey exterior of the DNA aliens are just humans, which makes the conflict Ben, Gwen, and Kevin get into a lot harder, because under the surface, these are innocent people. So rather than just taking them down for the greater good, Ben finds a way that actually ends up stopping the parasite's effect and save the human trapped inside, using the Omnitrix to repair their DNA back to normal, killing off the connection from the Xenocyte. The hybrid use these Xenocytes as a weapon in their goals of preserving serving their species. Over a long span of time with essentially no genetic diversity, the hybrid's immune system has weakened them greatly. You can sneeze on them and their bodies couldn't handle it. This whole situation has left these self-titled superior beings in a sterile state, meaning that they can no longer create offspring. I guess you can say, you're not gonna go far, kid. 
four people will get that joke. Anyway, in order to, you know, not die out and have their species end, they come up with some plans. Plan one, take out all the other species in the universe to go down with them. If they can't exist, you can either. The other idea is sending out these xenocytes to mix their hybrid DNA with other species to cleanse the galaxy of the gross other alien species DNA. Ugh. Just so that their greater than everyone else DNA can live on. The only combatant to this is Ben and those repair abilities. But the hybrid aren't just stopping there. In fact, the big plot for them revolves around building some sort of warp gate between their world and Earth so that they can directly take over wiping us all out. It's what they're doing to many other planets and their inhabitants. Which now we circle back to the weather towers being built. It's similar to terraforming a planet to be sustainable for your species to live, hence them wanting a cooler temperature. Through this arc in the show, we do catch up with Grandpa Max. Briefly, he seemingly sacrifices his life to take down a hybrid base as Ben, Gwen, and Kevin give some emotional reactions to it. What? No! Wow. Yeah, they really cared about Grandpa Max, it seems, but uh, to be fair, he's not really dead. I mean, for now, to the audience, and to them, he is, but he comes back a whole season and a half later, in a very climactic way, may I add, bringing with him a whole new slew of plumbers in training from around the galaxy. Also, Azimuth returns, you know, the creator of the Omnitrix. Through this chess game of taking out the DN aliens and thwarting the plans of the hybrid, Ben and company end up recruiting others to their team who all have some sort of alien DNA already a part of them, Ben 10's own little Avenger squad if you will, or Alien Force, which is why the show is called Alien Force. Aside from the main three we already know, the team ends up consisting of Julie Yamamoto. Ben's love interest slash girlfriend, she ends up joining in a pretty fun and more accidental way and she's not part alien, she just plays tennis. She plays tennis, I play tennis, call me Ben Tennis son. Alright I'm out, see you later, video over. But on a date that Ben and her were on, they end up getting interrupted when some strange creature is causing chaos which has Ben become an alien and Julie seeing this, but kind of being into it. Hey, to each their own. But this little creature ends up being misunderstood and not really a threat at all, so Julie ends up adopting it, naturally. Naming this creature Ship because this creature can turn into one. Now that's pretty cool. Being a galvanic mechamorph, Ship is able to change its form frequently. Julie herself is a good character in the efforts of showing who Ben is and how he grows or his lack of growth. Through their relationship in the series, we see ups and downs and it's something we will touch more on later when speaking about Ultimate Alien. Alan Albright is a part human, part pyronite 10 year old, very clearly resembling one of Ben's original aliens. In fact, the first alien we ever see him turn into Heat Blast. His character has some heavy ties to Kevin and this group called the Amalgam Kids, which is something we will go deeper into in part 3 of this series when we discuss Omniverse, where that storyline is expanded. Cooper is someone who we met in the original Ben 10 series as the grandson of another plumber who has the ambition to help out and here he returns in glorious fashion, wielding a giant robotic suit. Professor Paradox is a professor, but one who can travel through any point in time and space. His character is great and serves a bigger point beyond just this part here on the team. But for his backstory, thanks to an incident at Area 51 in the 1950s, he was ripped from reality, being able to never age and be anywhere at any time needed. Michael Morningstar, a high school girl manipulator who lures them out to drain them of their energy. He's a creep and mainly sucks, pun intended. But later on, they need him for the final fight, so they just let him free. I'm sure this idea won't backfire later on in another series. This was the final main group working together to take down the threat. But there is another side character that I want to directly highlight as they have some major relevance to the whole arc. At one point in the show, Ben and a hybrid get stuck together on a hostile planet and have to work together to survive. This gives us a great look at Ben's growth in general and how he much prefers to use logic and start a dialogue rather than his fists. But he still will use those as often as he can. He calls this hybrid Riney as a nickname and throughout the events of survival, we see how different ways of thought thought and perspective can play a major factor in the grand scheme of things. There is a moment when Riney gets his arm cut off and Ben uses Swamp Fire to fix the problem. This was a pivotal moment where Riney is conflicted on his and his species ideals. Why would the enemy offer an extending hand, no pun intended, of support like this? This hits him hard, so much that when they are able to get off the planet, Riney stays behind to be alone with his thoughts 
to work out these mixed emotions he's having. This is all important in just a minute. Through the course of the show thus far, we've had to follow Ben as he is low on confidence but has to carry everything with him. He has to step up and be a leader. It becomes this struggle of what he feels he should do versus what his mentors would tell him to do, and not knowing what to do in general. He does his best, however, and when the final confrontation starts with the hybrid, rather than listening to Asmuth's strategy to just defeat them, even with Asmuth giving him the master controls, which unlocks the full use and potential of the Omnitrix, Ben chooses to do the opposite, to just do it his way, and that is in the form of compassion, and for the confrontation not ending in an all-out fight. He speaks with the leaders and extends a solution that works for everyone. What if there was a way to keep the hybrid species alive and well without all the killing of planet inhabitants or mutating them into DNA aliens? We've seen how Ben is able to heal the humans back from said DNA aliens, so he uses the Omnitrix to heal the weakened DNA within the leaders completely fixing the DNA and genes that were pulling their species down. But what really seals the deal is when Riney shows back up from his alone time in all emo music playlist, telling the leaders the kindness that Ben has shown him and has given him a new perspective. They all agree with the points that Riney brings up and they appoint him to be the new leader of the hybrids to help usher in a new era of peace and love, as their species is able to live on thanks to Ben's efforts. Grandpa Max tells Ben that there is nothing more he can teach him or Gwen or even Kevin, giving the team their own sense of respect for how they've come together and how Ben navigated the final battle by avoiding the battle. The only way that this was ended was because Ben chose to not listen to his mentors, finally becoming his own person and showing true leadership in the face of impossible odds. This ends the first arc of Alien Force taking up the majority of the Alien Force series. And while the big evil plans were stopped, Ben's ego starts to creep back up on him. Coming up next, it's Ben 10 Alien Force. Before we go into the second arc of Alien Force, I thought we should familiarize ourselves with all of the aliens that Ben has and acquires in this series, ranging from a whole new set of 10 aliens plus more additional aliens and some returning friends from the original series. Since we saw Swampfire first in Alien Force, let's start there. He's a Methanosian, a plant-like being that can ignite a flamethrower essentially out of his hands, or vines, or whatever they are. It's okay, it'll grow back. Well, that'll grow back too. He's like the regenerator in Resident Evil 4, because he can regenerate. Being able to reattach and put himself back together when he gets blasted and cut up. Echo Echo is a Sonorosian. He's cute, he's annoying, and he can multiply. Being able to create high-pitched frequencies so powerful, there's almost nothing it can't do because of it. Doubling or tripling or whatever numbering it, because like I said, he can multiply into a bunch of independent clones, thus combining to make a literal wall of sound. Humongosaur is a Vaxasaurian, resembling a big, bulking, dinosaur-like build. Aside from just having some very powerful strength, he can either increase or decrease in size and mass depending on what the situation calls for. He's just a giant ball of pure raw power, and is the muscle alien Ben often goes to to take care of so many problems they face. Chromastone is a Crystal Sapien, built very tough but also practical as energy-based attacks just bounce off of him. Unless he wants to absorb it, he can just do that. He can then channel that into laser-like beams from any of the protruding shards around his body or from his hands, like a normal laser-firing alien would. He also has a strong connection to another alien species, the Petrosapiens, which is Diamond Head's species of alien. Big Chill is a Necrophygian, who looks like a big blue bat. He's able to fly, of course, as well as creating a tunnel or stream of wind that can lower the temperature and turning things into ice just by touching them. Similar to Ghost Freak in the original series, Ben starts dealing with some weird feelings from Big Chill, to the point where he would black out and Big Chill would fully be in control. But rather than Big Chill being evil, he was just very hungry. And for a good reason, because the big surprise was that Big Chill was pregnant. So Ben, as Big Chill, gave birth and quickly acted like he wasn't the father and never wanted to speak about this again. How positive are you that you're not 100 her father? 100% positive. You are the father! Ah! And that's all I Brainstorm is a part of the Cerebro Crystal 
crustacean species, so naturally he looks like what a crab would look like with a neck. The name makes even more sense because of the giant brain he has under his head flap things. He's insanely smart and deals in electricity in a slew of ways. Jet Ray is an aerophibian, resembling this long boy here from The Secret Saturdays, just red and with wings. With those wings, he is the most capable and fastest flying alien in Ben's arsenal. He can also shoot some green beams from his tail and eyes, making him quite a powerful and useful alien for many fights. Spider Monkey is an arachnid chimp. Yeah, that makes sense because that's exactly what he is. So with all of the powers that come from a spider and from a monkey, they are both present here, like web shooting and dexterity. Goop is one of the coolest aliens out there. He is a polymorph and is not the goop that is goop, but it's the little flying saucer control above manipulating the goop. It's a unique idea and a fun design. He could be squashed and splatted, mushed and mangled, but he can form around to handle those blows and re-goop himself together. From there, we get a few more new aliens that Ben is able to use, like Lodestar, a biot Savarshan who deals with magnets. How do those work? But for real, he can cast magnetic fields, magnetic pulses, and can move around almost like flying through his ability of magno telekinesis. Wrath, this Tony the Tiger looking dude, is an apoplexian who houses a bunch of strength, similar to Humongosaur. His speed is quick and he can use his rage to intimidate foes when they need a proper smackdown. There's also Upchuck, but like a new Upchuck as there are two separate versions of Upchuck from the Gourmand species. So this new look, the Merc version, version of Upchuck is technically new. After all of that, we do get some fan favorites making a big return throughout the show, like Diamond Head, Ghost Free, Cannonball, and Way Big. And that's all of Ben's aliens. Yup, I didn't skip a single one at all. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Except for one, Alien X. Alien X is OP. Basically, he is this omnipotent celestial sapien, and Ben's most powerful alien. But in order to access Alien X from the Omnitrix, he must enter this pocket dimension where he is greeted by two floating green heads, all with their own personalities and representing a different voice. Bellicus is the voice of rage and aggression, Serena is the voice of love and compassion, and then Ben represents the voice of reason. All three of them have to come to a mutual agreement on how they are going to use the power of Alien X before Alien X can do anything. It's a cool concept that comes with a smart limited factor that relies on combining rage, love, and reason, making sure that this all-powerful alien can't be overused and a scapegoat for any situation. Being omnipotent, he is able to warp space, time, and reality, and just in general, do whatever. If he needs to fly, he can fly. If he needs to multiply, he can multiply. If he's 15 years too late to return a Blockbuster rental, he could just go back in time to when Blockbuster was still around and return it like a good Samaritan. Oh man, he forgot to be kind and rewind. Take back all I said. To go over everything Alien X can do, can't do, and the amount of lore and importance he has from this series, the next series, Omniverse, and beyond, would be longer than this video itself. But regardless, I'll say this. He's a cool concept that comes with a really cool twist, and the Celestial Sapien species itself has more ties into the next series, Ultimate Alien. So while we took a good look at the main story with an alien force being the hybrid issue, there still was another smaller arc that would wrap up the series. And if I'm being honest, it's kind of a mixed bag in comparison versus the more thought-provoking and complex storyline we just had. It's also full of a bunch of filler-esque episodes, but a lot of them do prove to be interesting and just all around a fun time. Now, there were filler episodes during the first arc as well, so I don't see it as a fault. Some noteworthy episodes of the series include an episode where Ben and Gwen get grounded as Ben gets caught by his parents in a battle with the hybrid and he goes into alien form. It's just silly to think that Ben, who has already gone through all of this stuff at 10 and now 15, is still getting grounded by his parents. It's hard to forget that he is still just a kid who has a curfew and school and whatever else his more mundane day-to-day -day would consist of, like going to Mr. Smoothie. Oof, they must have really good insurance. Funny, that reminds me of Mega's XLR, where they constantly blew up fake MTV references as a petty joke 
joke that is still so funny to watch. We also get to see Verdona, or better yet, Ben and Gwen's grandmother. Yeah, so it turns out Max just has a thing for aliens. Like, we already know from the original series his space bed escapades with Xylene, but in that interim, he spent time with the purple magical anodite, Verdona. She comes into the series as a villain for them to deal with, but by the end it runs oddly, but greatly wholesome, where she was just happy to spend time with her grandchildren. So this means that Max's kids all have some sort of alien DNA in them, and now all of their descendants, like Ben and Gwen, have their own special spark. Which explains why Gwen was able to conjure magic out of just reading some spells. Which is kind of an explanation for the concept of mana, a powerful energy inside of any living organism that some can harness into magic, which Gwen can do because of her connection to Verdona. And through Verdona, we get a look back at her story with Max and see more of him back in his younger days of beating up alien butt and beating up alien butt, if you know what I'm saying. But as far as this next arc, the Ben we deal with now post-stopping the hybrid is back to being confident in himself, hearkening back to the way Ben was more ego-driven in the original series. He knows now that he doesn't have to rely on his mentors and can take care of stuff on his own. It's a nice return to form for him, but it also feels like a bit of a regression based on him feeling like he was growing on from this attitude. At the same time, it's still fun to see him be a bit of a brat sometimes. So even if it's a bit of a regression, it's okay. He's so cocky though, that he wants those master controls back for his Omnitrix. I guess the voice command feature just isn't enough for him these days. The master controls being unlocked would give him full access to the whole arsenal of aliens with no cooldown or limited features. So good old Ben tries to jailbreak it, causing it to generate an explosion that results in a couple of things. Like Kevin being stuck as a mixture of a few aliens materials thanks to his powers for a while. And also that Azmuth is not happy with Ben, resulting in a trust factor being broken between the two. Ben thinks he's ready to use it to its full abilities and Azmuth not believing that. Oh yeah, did I mention that Vilgax makes a return to the series? Last we saw him, he was the big menacing factor for Ben to overcome. But here he basically becomes this sort of equal playing field punching bag that just gets in the way sometimes. He's no longer this major threat to Ben, just something Ben has to deal with here or there. He also needs Ben's help on his homeworld at one point, which you would think would result in like a mutual, hey, appreciate you let's just let bygones be bygones and I'll stop trying to defeat you or conquer the galaxy or whatever. Instead, Vilgax still is going to do bad guy things later on. We spend time on the planet Primus, where in which the DNA samples of all the aliens in the Omnitrex data is held. Also, Albedo is introduced. He was the former assistant to Azmuth that aided in his work who went rogue with his own plans of making his own version of the Omnitrix. When Azmuth told him that he couldn't have it and thinks that Ben is unworthy of having it himself. But due to making his own that replicates Ben's Omnitrix and the sample DNA of human beings being Ben, it causes him to become a literal clone of Ben and become stuck this way. This makes him utterly repulsed and needs Ben's actual Omnitrix to restore him back from this Ben clone. One of their fights results in both Omnitrixes locking onto one another, which almost caused a universe ending explosion, but rather than that happening, this happened. All of his colors are switched. He's still Ben, but negative Ben. And then Azmuth comes around to really teach Albedo a lesson, taking apart the core of his Omnitrex, leaving him trapped in this reverse Ben from which he is not too happy about, and he plans to get his revenge at some point, and that point is when he and Vilgax team up. In the finale of this arc, or for the back half of Alien Force, I like to think that arc means all random coincidences, since it feels less cohesive than the hybrid stories, Vilgax and Albedo work together to take Ben down, both seeking pure revenge. Albedo steals the Ultimatrix, a more powerful version of the Omnitrix that can do whatever the Omnitrix can do, but better. Only if you know how to properly use its functionality in selling more toys. I, I mean, basically being a pilot to tease the next series, Ultimate Alien. Uh, I mean, has access to make the aliens more powerful. That's totally what I mean. No matter how much Albedo messes with it, he can't get back into his own body. He's still stuck as Ben. But with Vilgax, they set up a plan to get Ben by kidnapping both Kevin and Gwen, baiting Ben to come after them. Ben follows the trail right to them, and when he confronts Albedo, they get into a major fight where while they are both transformed into Humongosaur, you just know that this fight isn't going to be fair. They don't call the Ultimatrix the Ultimatrix for no reason. He uses it to turn into Ultimate Humongosaur. Ah, there it is. 
there's that tease for the next series. Ben gets defeated in battle due to being overpowered by Albedo's ultimate transformation abilities, with Vilgax giving him the chance to save his cousin and his friend if he gives up the Omnitrix. We've seen this before in the original series, but he gives it up and Vilgax now fully has control of the Omnitrix to himself. Grandpa Max appears to help out and they can escape, but the tensions between Albedo and Vilgax heat up because they made a deal, Albedo needs the Omnitrix to turn back to his regular self out of his Ben form. But you never tell Vilgax what to do, so he double crosses Albedo and he holds him captive. Vilgax now heads to Ben's hometown where the fight continues, but Ben being powerless gives him a chance to use his smarts rather than his fists. And we're finally going to use that helpful little voice command feature to activate a self-destruct feature. This is something that Vilgax doesn't believe he'd fully let happen, but to his surprise, Ben is willing to sacrifice the device in order to stop Vilgax, causing it to explode, knocking out Vilgax, and leaving the Omnitrix destroyed. In revenge, or the revenge of the revenge, when Vilgax awakens, he sends his ship hurtling towards Bellwood, which the engine on board would cause enough damage to destroy the whole town and anything within a hundred mile radius. During them all working on the situation to stop this, Ben speaks to Albedo and gives him a chance to leave this life behind and to be freed in exchange for the Ultimatrix. I mean, he's already trapped as Ben, might as well just give up this revenge quest too. But when he initially refuses, Ben activates its self-destruction feature, and Albedo knows this time he isn't playing around, so he hands up the Ultimatrix, in which Ben immediately uses it to become Ultimate Swamp Fire. Yep, there it is, more promo for the next series. I'm picking up what you're putting down. He helps finish the fight as they pilot the ship to instead crash into water, rather than, you know, a city, a town, any form of landmass, really. As they escape the ship, Vilgax breaks it open allowing water to pour in as he becomes his true form. A weird big old squid looking thing. I'm sure this is totally the last we'll see of him, right? right? Anyway, that's a problem for me to discuss later on in this video, and we're not there yet. The whole team hugs it out, and thus Alien Force is over. And overall, Alien Force, in comparison to the original show, does a lot right to further the characters, and adds a lot of really cool ideas into the world of Ben 10. But on the other hand, the show felt a little less focused on the storyline since the real big storyline ended, and we are left with a lot more filler than focus towards the end. The stuff we learn and get to see through these fillers is still really good. I genuinely liked a lot of the side characters and fun moments we still got to have that felt more like the original series. And while I like everything with Albedo and Vilgax coming back, it felt like it happened all so fast, where the hybrid arc felt like it was better told because it didn't have a rushed feeling pace. Alien Force does set a new bar for what Ben 10 can be and where the series wants to go, leaving us at the end just waiting for whatever comes next. When Ben 10 ended, we only had to wait a couple of days to see what Alien Force would be. Alien Force ended in March, of 2010, and we only would have to wait a month before Ultimate Alien would come out, giving us a quick enough turnaround from show to show to find out more about Ultimate Alien since we got that little sneak peek at the end of Alien Force. However, before Alien Force ended, we were given another live action movie in 2009 titled Ben 10 Alien Swarm. So for a nice little breather in between the cartoons, let's check in on this film. Dude, I don't know if I can pound your grandma. Yup, that's right, Ben 10 is back in the world of live action, now as the older, cooler Ben Tennyson. Premiering on Cartoon Network November 25th, 2009, it came out while the Alien Force series was still premiering. Alex Winter returns once again to helm the film as the director, now with Cartoon Network backing the film a lot more with a bigger budget, mixing that with this being during the CN Real era. A time in Cartoon Network's history where on a station called Cartoon Network, they really wanted to make anything but, offering a slew of new live action shows, and of course, what would pair better with that than putting $40 million into a live action version of their hit cartoon show, Ben 10, one more time. Now, just because the budget may be higher and the same dude is directing the project, that doesn't always equal out to a better film. Race Against Time was a campy but fun ride with familiar characters that gave a lot of fan service to fans of Ben 10. And while that can certainly be found within this movie, it just lacks a certain level of silliness. Instead, 
instead opting for a more serious in tone, darkly color paletted, and just a tad too over dramatic flair to it all. It really made me think that I was just on the wrong channel. Well, I didn't watch this on TV, that's just an over exaggeration, okay? We start the film with Kevin and the crew investigating a black market underground alien tech deal where these nano chips are at the core of the deal. The person organizing the deal turns out to be Elena Validus, a new character making her debut in the Ben 10 world that turns out to be a family friend, or at least was a family friend. Her father Victor was the ex-partner plumber of Max who is missing and she blames Max for that reason claiming he betrayed him. But of course, what's a secret alien tech deal without a random mysterious third party showing up to cause chaos all around? The secret guy here can clearly control these nano chips and a fight breaks out where the trio have to start showing off their cool powers in live action. Ben turns into Big Chill which quickly shows off the budget's effect, where the CGI in the movie, for a TV movie, looks pretty darn good. Kevin starts doing his absorbing thing and Gwen starts using her magical abilities. It's an all-out brawl with a lot of flair from our heroes here. After the battle, they make their way to the secret underground plumber's base with a nano chip to run some diagnostics on it and to learn more about what they are up against and wow, the base looks pretty sleek. Lots of green in here. Elena follows them to the plumber's base and Max rushes in to make sure that she leaves and never comes back to bother them again. But she just wants some answers. She thinks that Max betrayed her father and wants to find him and Max thinks that her father betrayed him and wants nothing to do with her as an extension of her father. Ben, however, wants to go out and help her as Max tells him not to. So naturally, Ben disobeys those wishes and decides to run off or motorcycle off with her on this journey. They end up walking into a trap where they are swarmed with nanochip control people and instead of fighting, Ben's watch is on a break and can't take any calls right now. So these two must fight their way out of this trap and escape with as little conflict as possible. It would have been cool to get at least a smaller little alien fight here, but all right. Gwen and Kevin don't initially want to be a part of that, but end up not following Grandpa Max's orders and begin to investigate themselves, trying to figure out the real reason Max and Victor had a falling out. And we do find out that the disagreement they had was over the same nanochips we are dealing with already, as Victor thinks that there is something more sinister about them, and Max just wants him to drop it and leave it alone. So rather than just look into them and run some tests, he just turns his back on Victor and by extension, Elena. Or it could also be for the fact that he was stealing the nano chips when he left. That could probably break some trust as well. Later on, we get this really cool car chase between Kevin's sick whip and the nano chips that have formed into some giant spheres. Yeah, it's spherical. spherical. You know, for some nano balls, they are quite large. The car ends up getting flipped over and Ben jumps into action by turning into Humongosaur as he fights these balls head on. The CGI looks pretty good here and then he completely destroys Kevin's sick whip by using it as a weapon. Nice one, Ben. Good to see you're still a jerk. Now we have to make a major insurance claim. Afterwards, Max still doesn't do his due diligence in finding out what these chips truly are, as we just chalk it up to him still being hurt by Victor, feeling like Victor betrayed him. He just chooses to be ignorant to the dangers of these things and what they bring. Does Max think that he has a crush on her? But hello, what about Julie? She just not exist in this live action world? Ben definitely has some flirtatious moments with Elena, so I don't know if Ben's a player or if Julie just simply doesn't exist here. We find out that the chips are multiplying at a fast rate. They are being shipped all over the world and since they resemble insects, there must be some sort of queen nano chip bug thing, so we must go after it. Grandpa Max, however, stupidly lets the captured nano chip out and it takes control of him. Frankly, he deserves it. Something's been a bit off with him this whole movie. Kevin, even though Ben destroyed his car, gifts Ben his own car because that's what good friends do. So they zip over to the shipping factory where in which we find Elena's dad, who is in fact that mysterious man and the queen nano chip is inside of him controlling all the rest. For this battle, it has to be fought on a nano level so that the nano queen can be taken down and the only way this can happen is if Ben gets down to nano size. So we get our first look at a brand new alien for Ben and the third and final alien moment of the film, Nanomech. We get to see him another time later on in Ultimate Alien, but this was his first introduction into Ben's alien roster. He can fly and shrink down to a microscopic level, which is perfect for this nano fight. He ends up taking down the queen in this screen vomit of CGI that feels less than stellar in comparison to the rest of the movie. And then the day is saved, just like Elena's dad, which Max gets a chance to right his wrongs with and make up with him. Max also gives Ben the offer of taking over the plumbers, but Ben declines because he's not ready for that, nor does he truly want that. But that's not the first no of this ending. The second no comes from Gwen when Elena thinks
thinks that she's a part of the team now. What did you mean when you said we're a great team? You're not on the team. I bet you feel real dumb right now. But there was something that bothered me throughout the film, and I think I can pinpoint this to the off feeling of the way characters are handled here. For the return to live action and the movies not being too far apart in release, the original actors didn't return to reprise their roles. For Ben, Ryan Kelly fits the look and ego of Ben great, but the character overall feels like that cockiness that comes with ego doesn't hit in a charming way, and instead it hits in a pretentious, all too serious way. I didn't get that. Shut up. Gwen, played by Galadriel Steinman, is pretty good at capturing Gwen at a core level. A bit more of the emotional side here is shown rather than being more analytical but still is a good interpretation of Gwen. Kevin, played by Nathan Keyes, brings that bad boy teenage angst perfectly to the big, the, the small, the, a, 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 some sort of screen, but it muddled down thanks to the writing that they gave him. His dialogue just seems so underwhelming and not giving anything deeper to say rather than some moody responses. I mean, there was a writer's strike going on around the time, but we'll get to that in a second. Alyssa Diaz is a good Elena. There's not much to base off of her sense this is a new addition to Ben 10, but she suffers for similar dialogue related issues, and her just being an emotional hook to the stakes of her father in the film. But I can overlook a lot of that as just a way to serious drama filled fun time. But Grandpa Max, played by Barry Corbin, suffers from the writing in a whole different way. Throughout the whole movie, he felt off in terms of how he handled every situation. Why is he so careless in his plumber work? Why is his good natured spirit now just replaced by a salty old man who doesn't come off friendly or approachable, or even capable of a fight like Grandpa Max would be in the cartoons. It's almost like as if he's a different character altogether. Not just slight little changes like in Race Against Time, but a full, complete, opposite version of Max here. While we know he gets corrupted and controlled by a nanochip at one point, it almost feels like something was controlling his decisions anyway. Ooh, a conspiracy theory. What if from the very moment when Max's friendship with Victor ended, was the work of the nanochip starting to control his actions and laying low as the queen gets her plans in motion. Or none of that's true and his character is just the worst. And it makes the film so off-putting compared to the rest of the cartoon series and even the last live action movies version of Grandpa Max. It's just a weird way to handle it, literally draining this film of a lot of the charm that makes Ben 10 work so well amongst all the action in more serious moments. If we really break down why this film feels so different, the scapegoat could be the various Hollywood guild strikes that were happening as this film was in pre-production, production, and post-production. The one that would have affected this film the most would have been the writer's strike as the main problem with this film is the writing. The story and plot are all fine and dandy, but the dialogue and character direction is just so unnatural, and it feels so out of place for a Ben 10 project. Sure, Ben 10 has had many different iterations of 2D animation, live action, and 3D animation, but what hadn't changed through all of those versions of Ben 10 are these characters at a core level. By making this dark and serious without blending that with what makes these characters special, you lose what makes the audience care about these characters, their motivations, and the plot overall. They did, however, use up that bigger budget and the film is shot overall pretty well. Only a few scenes of intense CGI that make the action a little hard on the eyes though, but for the most part it looked great. The budget also went into shooting a few scenes with IMAX cameras and it was even going to have some sort of 3D component, but this would later be decided against by Alex Winter who thought 3D was just too gimmicky. And how do you even do 3D through cable TV? And 3D TVs weren't really a thing yet. When it comes to the grand list of Ben 10 series and movies thus far in our journey of covering Ben 10, sadly Alien Swarm may just be my least favorite entry into this world. I still enjoyed some aspects of the film, but in comparison, the lack of some levity really hinders what this movie could have been. In fact, we could have seen a third live action movie from Alex Winters continuing the older Ben story, but thanks to the CN real era fading out and thinking back on Cartoon Network spending 40 million on the last production, it just never worked out to become a reality. Alien Swarm is for sure watchable and has some really cool action scenes and some maybe over the top moody atmosphere and dialogue comes off as more campy to some, but so far this is easily the weakest Ben 10 entry we've looked at. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it though of course, but with that being said, we have another set of tales to tell in the older Ben story. Let's take a look at Ultimate Alien. Why are you all looking at us like that? Alright, 
So now we enter Ultimate Alien. Rather than a new series, it just feels like a mid-season refresh, slightly changing the title, but the main core of the show is still the same. Every other series in the world of Ben 10 has drastically changed the style or tone of the show, and Ultimate Alien is just kind of more alien force. But now with the aliens being able to go ultimate. With that being said, the stakes here do continue to rise, with Ben and crew not being as restricted into where they can go. Being able to travel throughout the galaxy in the Rust Bucket 3. Now, with Ben being 16 and able to drive, there is a bit of a slight moving the characters forward in that scope. But for the most part, it's still Ben dealing with that ego that he got back. But to an even worse extent, because we start this series with a bang. Or rather, a click, because his secret identity was published online thanks to his superfan, Jimmy. And just like that, Ben has to deal with everyone knowing that he is this hero, which does come come with a lot of unwanted attention. Well, Ben does like a lot of the attention, and recognition sometimes, I mean he wanted it all the way back when he was 10, but this also comes with a price on the family and friends of Ben. All of his enemies can easily get to him by going after the thing that can hurt him the most, family. Remember at the end of the last series he gave Vilgax the Omnitrix to save Gwen and Kevin, or in the first series where he gave up the Omnitrix to save Gwen from Vilgax and Kevin? This just writes itself how easy it is to get to Ben now. This kind of causes a lot of older villains to make their series return from back in the original series and further some interesting dynamics with them. But just like Alien Force, Ultimate Alien is kind of split between two major arcs. One that is wholly unique to the series and one that has been building up steam in the background since the original series. So let's jump into what this first arc is. Our main baddie is Agrigor, an Osmosian, no not the Jones variety, but of the Kevin variety as Kevin's part alien half is is Osmosian. Agrigor is a collector, going around the Andromeda galaxy collecting five species of aliens. You know, I'm something of a collector myself. His goal is to hook them up to his chamber pods and drain their powers into him to make him the ultimate Agrigor, or whatever. A running theme in Ben 10 has been some form of draining power or energy, and I guess we still have to deal with it more here. But uh-oh, the five trapped aliens work together and plan an escape, causing them to all scatter all across Earth, which makes Agrigor Gore have to go after them once again. Ben gets tangled up in the mix in some efforts to help them and at the same time of course scanning their DNA so he can have access to their species since they are all new to the Omnitrex being from Andromeda. Man, every time I say the word Andromeda, I'm reminded of one of the biggest bag fumbles in video game history. Ugh, disgusting. With help from the plumbers, Ben has successfully been able to get them on their way back home. It's a quick arc, nothing too massive here, is what I would say if Agrigor didn't swoop in, wreck shop, and then proceed to recapture all those said aliens once more, meaning all of that previous work was for nothing. But because of this, we get to know Agrigor's real plans here. Aside from becoming the ultimate version of himself, he is after the pieces of the Map of Infinity, a guide that will lead him to the Forge of Creation where the Celestial Sapiens reside. They are the species of alien that Alien X is sampled from and he wants to absorb a baby Celestial Sapien. In order to stop Agrigor, Ben and the crew must work together with the help from Azmuth and Professor Paradox to try and collect these pieces first. It's like a nice scavenger hunt race, if it weren't for the fact that they continuously fail at this part and never seem to really get a one-up on Agrigor. This is a good place to point out the characters themselves at this point on the team and where their focuses lie. Gwen, while still being the glue for the team, has more of an interesting story outside of the main story and I want to cover separately later on. Here, aside from Ben working on his leadership and learning to humble himself, has to learn how to drop the bad part of his ego and use the good that comes out to lead the team. Kevin goes through the most here in the series. Being an Osmosian himself, he feels this natural responsibility to take down Agrigor. We followed his personality growth through Alien Force, where he genuinely cares for Ben and Gwen, but still struggles with his old tendencies of a life of crime. While he has done more good than what can be considered bad, this power struggle of absorbing energy is what can be the catalyst to set him back in his old ways. By him absorbing matter, he is able to control his powers in his mind without worry, unlike what energy energy does to him. Through the events of dealing with Agrigor, this anxious feeling drowns Kevin in tempting him to absorb said energy, fully knowing what could happen if he did, but he holds on strong to not do so. We get our first dose of some timeline time travel when young Ben 10, at the age of 10, comes to work with his older self, older Kevin and older
Elder Gwen. This all being explained as he came through the barrier of the Forge of Creation. Back in the OG series, we got a look at some possible future timelines that Ben could become, and now with this instance, it kind of teases what we may look forward to in the following series. Multiple Bens from multiple timelines that are not canon anymore to this timeline, but their own timeline. This Ben, however, is the original Ben from the original series now having to team up with his older self six years in the future. His real purpose here serves as a mirror for modern Ben to look at, examining himself and who he was at a younger age. The other purpose is to still think that Kevin is a bad dude, and helps incite one of the biggest problems going forward. When it's time for the big fight against Agrigor, Ben is basically defeated, leaving Kevin as the last resort to defeat Agrigor once and for all. But in order to take him down, younger Ben makes a judgment call to tell Kevin to absorb the energy from his Omnitrix. Hesitant at first, Kevin still does this as it seemed that there was no other way, and in doing so, he becomes the Kevin-11 mutated amalgamation of aliens. Luckily, this was effective in taking down Agrigor. Unfortunately, those warnings and uneasy feelings of absorbing energy came true as he is completely wrapped up back in his younger evil ways. This causes young Ben to gloat about him being right, but my dude, it was your fault. You said, hey, take some of this energy here and finish the fight, and now you blame him for going off the rails? Again, as much as we like Ben, he still kinda sucks. Little gaslighting jerk sent him back to the past. Kevin is now completely consumed by these powers and returns to finish off all that wronged him. From small petty loans of a few bucks to much bigger issues like hating Ben again for making him the way he is, going as far as to vow to kill Ben and Gwen, which adds stakes to the trio's relationship with Kevin over the course of the last series and this series. Ben and Kevin had become a lot closer and more brother-like while Gwen and Kevin have become a couple, and now even her, the only one who in the beginning of Alien Force can get through to him, can no longer do so. Because of these tensions and these trials of trying to stop him, Ben sees no other way in taking Kevin down than vowing to do the same, and killing him. Grandpa Max offers some advice to Ben, saying that this decision is probably the right one, and would be the easier and smarter move. He does mention, however, that Ben has always come up with another and more peaceful way of handling situations. The conflict here is beyond personal, and the weight that these issues hold on the whole team is heavy. Gwen, being torn up with all of this, constantly tries to stop them from fighting, but to no avail. We learn a bit about Kevin's past as well, the mysterious stuff that happened to him between the original series and Alien Force, wherein which he learned to get out of his monstrous state and harness his absorbing powers for matter instead of energy. But when things get too fierce, Gwen makes a judgment call and recruits a familiar face from the last series, Michael Morningstar, who now goes by Darkstar for help. See, I told you he'd be back later. Before using his expertise though, Kevin, while fighting Max, is confronted with a dude. A dude who happens to be his stepdad, Harvey, where we see a little taste of his home life when growing up. It's pretty powerful and emotional, but not as powerful and emotional as the group finally being able to turn him back out of his monstrous state. Okay, I lied. They just go back to normal and we act like nothing even happened. They also got to stop Darkstar from fully absorbing all his powers for evil. I'm sure he'll be back at some point. But before we go into the the back half of Ultimate Alien and discuss the other really cool stories and major final arc, let's take a look at the Ultimate Aliens. Now, to go over every returning alien would literally take forever as there is a good mix of aliens who return, or at least are there, but they're never used. So let's just look at anything that debuted with an ultimate alien, and of course, the ultimate forms themselves. Ultimate Wild Mutt, he just becomes all red. And sharp. He's way more aggressive than just plain old Wild Mutt and can even speak now, so there's that going for him. Ultimate Cannonball just really gets some new armor over the top of his yellow spots, making them look silver. Oh yeah, he has these spikes now when he rolls around, so that's pretty cool and powerful. Ultimate Spider Monkey takes our lovable mix Spider Monkey Man and turns him into this large gorilla that is hoisted up in the air like Iron Spider. He's also purple now, which is Slick. The ultimate form here is a bit of a leap, but hey, he do just be chillin'. Ultimate Echo Echo sees this little dude as a good bit taller, which allows him to have a lot more of a powerful sonic wave attack, and can have the discs on him fully be controlled on their own. And he kinda just looks like Seismitoad from Pokemon. Ultimate Big Chill can now use fire abilities alongside his ice abilities, donning a spiky and cool red look with no noticeable growth in size. This one is definitely more powerful and speed-based rather than anything else. 
Ultimate Swamp Fire becomes a whole lot stronger at the cost of speed. But who can complain when instead of fruit or berries growing off you, you essentially get some grenades. To boot, his flames are even hotter than before. Ultimate Humongousaur is just amped up Humongousaur even more, and coming in at twice the size of him as well. He gains a bunch of armor on his back, knuckles, and tail. He just looks like a grumpier Hulk with a tail. Ultimate Way Big, of course, comes with some big style. Being the most powerful alien, well, ultimate alien. Alien X would still be the strongest, right? Okay, yeah, let's just go with that. His spikes get spikier, and he's still way big. Aside from all the ultimate forms, there are some redesigns of many of the older aliens, and for better or for worse, since they weren't redesigned for the look of the show like Omniverse would next do, it just feels like they had to be different enough so that they can make more toys, which, hey, I get it, but it's just hard not to be a fan of the original way that they looked, versus getting used to this new way that they look, especially since in the next two series of Ben 10, they're gonna change again, and again. There are also new aliens to Ultimate Force, which always are fun to see what else Ben is going to add to his roster. Like the captured aliens Agrigor rounded up. Amphibian is from the Amperi species, resembling an elegant squid-like jellyfish design. Dealing in electricity, he can easily reach out and shock you. He can walk through walls here and fly. He's much more unique than the other fish who can swim. Armadillo is from the Talpadan species and gives off those construction power tools armadillo vibes. I mean, he's just jacking Digmon's flow here. He's just only buffer. His arms operate as giant jackhammers and his strength is pretty high up there in terms of Ben's heavy hitters. Water Hazard is of the Orishan species, giving mad Mass Effect Krogan vibes here. He's able to shoot highly concentrated water blasts ranging in temperature. He has a nice balance of speed and strength, making him a well-rounded alien for battle. Terraspin is from the Geoshalon Aerios species species. He's a dang turtle, and I like turtles. He's really cool and maybe one of my more favorite aliens ever. He can shoot out tornado-like gusts of wind. He's bulky and strong, plus his flippers become like knives when he's acting like a Beyblade. NRG is from the Pripyatosian B species. Having another one of those fun names, no, I did not say his name is Energy, I said his name is N. R G. Get it? Just like XLR8. Anyway, he's basically a furnace. Well, inside the furnace, he's this bright red radioactive being who just wants love. I added the love part. He just looks like he needs a hug. But if you're gonna do so, please bring your radioactive suit and your Geiger counter. Between that and his use of lava from underground, he's a big bulking tin of pure red hot lava butt kicking. Yeah, that that is an actual sentence I wrote. Chameleon is from the Merlin Sapien species, and this purple spotted lizard can blend into his surroundings surrounding becoming invisible and can climb things very quickly and very well. Clockwork from the Chrono Sapien species is an egg timer, and when the timer is up, you get served a knuckle sandwich. I can't tell if that's a good joke or I'm severely sleep deprived trying to put this video together. The world may never know. Fast Track from the Citrakaya species is another blue speedster. That seems just a tad too redundant here. What do you want me to say? He runs fast. Accelerate runs fast. He looks cool if that's a plus I can say. Jerry Rig, a plancha hole species, is literally a little devil. Look at him. How can you not love this little old man looking gremlin? But staying true to his name, he can get up in some machinery and and then just rip it all back into its basic parts. He's a quick and strong little dude and we respect him here on this channel, even if we can't pronounce his species name correctly. Eatle, an Orictini species, is like a beetle, if that beetle had a menacing sharp metal bite. He can eat pretty much anything and can convert what he eats into a form of energy. Now, this time I said energy, not an RG. <laughs> anyway, he's pretty quick and his head can be used as a good strong source to run into enemies. The new aliens in Ultimate Force are pretty cool Cool, but we start to run into this problem of needing to create new aliens for both purposes of toys and to try to keep the show fresh and interesting. But while Ben can access his older aliens whenever as well, we run into a problem where newer aliens just become slightly tweaked versions of past aliens, either having straight up the same abilities or having those abilities and a lot more to offer, making the other classic legacy aliens feel obsolete and less effective for battle. But again, I do like a lot of the new aliens and what they have to bring to the table, especially Terraspin. I just love big turtles. <gasps> <sighs> Thank you.
The back half of Ultimate Alien focused on the Forever Knights, an organization that made their first appearance all the way back in the first season of the original series, being a frequently used side villain plot that built up a lot of the lore for who they are and why they are around. Ultimate Alien finally opens up the full plans for them as they find themselves in the middle of this battle regarding an ancient dragon's resurrection. We meet Old George, the founder of the Forever Knights who gathers every sector of them back together as their missions of collecting alien tech and other shenanigans strays too far from their initial mission, to stop this ancient dragon from coming back to life and if it does, they need to take it down. Old George himself is an immortal who fought the ancient dragon back in the Roman era long ago. Azimuth actually knows Old George and in fact is the one who helped him defeat the dragon originally when he gave him an all-powerful sword thinking that he was worthy of it, similar to him going back and forth debating if Ben is worthy of the Omnitrix or not. On the flip side of things, there is another group called the Flamekeeper Circle, or as we call them, the FKC. They actually worship the dragon and want to resurrect him. This dragon, however, was just in the form of a dragon and is actually this demonic multi-dimensional being whose goal is to invade this current dimension he is in. And his name is Dagon, and Dagon was once the dragon. The FKC have the ability to appear and disappear anywhere at any time thanks to their abilities to do so. I can't explain the science behind it, but it sure looks cool. At one point, they end up trying to recruit Ben to their side of the fight, but all it does for Ben is expose that the piece of Dagon that they claim to have is actually just the real version of Vilgax from when we last saw him at the end of Alien Force. Vilgax is actually just using the FKC as a form of harnessing the power of the Dagon. Once the Dagon is actually released upon the world, Vilgax is able to absorb him and essentially he becomes one with the Dagon. Asmith makes a choice saying Ben is worthy of the same sword that defeated the Dagon before, but Ben suggests that old George be the one to finish him, which he shouldn't have done. <laughs> leaves Ben with the sword and once he picks it up he is covered in armor fully becoming a knight himself. He ultimately takes down the Dagon Vilgax mashup monster by absorbing him into his Ultimatrix, leaving a final choice of what to do holding the power of the sword, the Dagon, and the Ultimatrix. Vilgax tries to persuade him in what to do, like being able to rid all evil out of the universe, but that comes from the perspective of what the user deems evil. His other choice is to change everything back to normal that had been done to Earth alone with free will. With everyone pressuring him on both sides, he exclaims that they all be quiet, while he raises his sword and shoots out a beam that restores Earth back to normal, repairing everything and everyone, but at the cost of losing all the power that he had. Asmuth asks for the sword back, as well as Ben's Ultimatrix, which makes Ben think that Asmuth has lost trust in him fully, but he tells him that it's not you, Ben, that isn't worthy of the Omnitrix, but this inferior Omnitrix not being worthy of you. So he straps Ben on a brand new Omnitrix, but but not just another updated version of it, it's THE Omnitrix. Not the basic one, the one that he's wanted all along from the start of even having the first Omnitrix. Just minus the master controls where Asmuth jokes to Ben that maybe on his 18th birthday he can have that. But really, this is all just a big tease for the next show, Omniverse. Even though the art style is completely changed in the next series, it's still a sequel to Ultimate Alien. Also, that whole ending with a final decision while wielding all that power reminds me of a similar ending in another man of action show, Generator Rex. Speaking of Generator Rex, in my video on that show, we talked about a special episode where this version of Ben 10 gets put into the world of Generator Rex. And it becomes such a fun team up episode dealing with the pocket dimension prison, a rogue prototype AI, and it being my multiverse of madness. Anyway, in that episode, however, we do get a look at another alien from Ben, Shock Squatch, a Gimlinopithecus species who, true to his name, is an electrical Sasquatch. But aside from that, there were a handful of really cool small or one-off storylines within the show that are worth highlighting outside of the main arcs. While still having a filler-ish feeling, at least these smaller storylines are pretty enjoyable. Like the Jimmy Kid who outed Ben as the hero he is, ends up having to help out on a mission which is a fun little way to use a character like him. It's like being a fan of Batman, and then one day Batman needs your help, then you go and become Robin. And I'm talking about the one that, you know, doesn't make it. There's this other character named Eunice who comes to stir the pot up at one point, but something Something's off about her. Hmm. 
Maybe it's the fact that she is a creation of Azmuth. She's literally a prototype Omnitrix. Azmuth's just one weird little frog thing. I also appreciated getting a little deeper dive into Azmuth's background. Getting to see him put more all into his work and research and his creations rather than the love of his life. Dealing with the questions that I proposed in the last video. Being this smart and creating something so powerful, but overlooking the bad side to it. The potential of what could go wrong. It's a fascinating little deep dive into Azmuth and I appreciate that we did get a look into it. Eon from the first live action movie Race Against Time makes an appearance as the older evil Ben from a different timeline that isn't the Race Against Time timeline because that timeline wasn't his timeline either. But now he's in this timeline where he faces off against a future good Ben that is also from this timeline and isn't Ben 10,000 from that potential future timeline. He's a Ben 10,000 that has met that Ben 10,000 so it's stuck with this timeline not creating that timeline. Are you keeping up here? Let's check the whiteboard. Yeah, that's about right. We see other characters from the second live action movie, which we just talked about, Alien Swarm, which include Elena and Victor Validus. Just cool to see live action movie characters actually become cartoon characters. We still get a lot of Ben's relationship with Julie here, and now he struggles with having a relationship and dealing with, you know, all the universe saving stuff. We get to learn a lot of lessons for Ben through these interactions, making the time spent with her worthwhile for the viewer and these characters. Also, you all remember Albedo? The evil Ben clone we talked about from Alien Force, well, he's still trapped looking like Ben. So without powers and now knowing of Ben's new fame, he tries to cash in on this by pretending to be Ben and putting on shows. Part of me says that dude kind of sucks. The other part of me is proud of his hustle and getting that bag. There's also this moment where all of Ben's ultimate alien forms escape from the watch and try and kill him. It's really reminiscent to the Destroy All Aliens movie when Ben in a dream sequence fights his escaped aliens. I say reminiscent in a sense where that Destroy All Aliens Aliens movie is about the young Ben 10 and I watched and covered it as a part of the young Ben 10 stuff in the last video but the destroy all aliens movie would premiere after ultimate alien so maybe the better phrasing here would be that destroy all aliens has a scene that is reminiscent to this moment in ultimate alien yeah Whiteboard, same. I also really like this mini arc we get with Charmcaster, which if you remember is this rival character to Gwen. Although for this storyline for her, she's not as rage and vengeance filled towards Gwen. She's on a mission and that mission is to go into the Ledger Domain realm, defeat this magical entity and resurrect her father. And when she actually does do that, the father says, hey, why that's stupid, Don't I don't want this, and reverses everything that she worked for. He goes back to being dead, all the people in Creatures that she have killed all come back, and I can't even imagine what that does to a person. And luckily I don't have to, the show shows me. And through this she ends up becoming true frenemies with Gwen, and later on when Michael Morningstar comes back because, or sorry, Darkstar comes back, excuse me, she gets herself into this entanglement with him as he is seeking the ultimate power that she can give him as Gwen tries to warn her about his real intentions. But those come out anyway, Charmcaster takes care of business and just needs some time alone to process everything that's gone on in her life and to find herself. It's a lot of lore and character building and I like that we do get to focus on some smaller side characters like this every now and then. At the end of the day, this series had a lot of fun here that made the downtime between the major arcs a nice breather in between the larger and longer narratives. Plenty of callbacks and old characters make their way into the series, whether silly or serious. They were, for the most part, really crucial in world building and character building a lot of the more deep-rooted lore within the Ben 10 universe. Something I appreciated and I'm sure big fans of Ben 10 also really appreciated. From Ben 10 to Alien Force to Ultimate Alien, the journey we have followed with Ben growing up as the multi-savior of the universe has been a wild ride thus far. From humble beginnings of a road trip to intergalactic space adventures filled with thrills and mystery, Ben 10 has felt like a thought out, well-written sci-fi action show that has a lot of heart, emotion, and thought provoking baked into the deep characters and intensive lore. The more you watch, the more connections you start to find. I think doing this series in succession, watching every Every episode and movie of Ben 10 ever is a lot to consume, but you remember so much more and are able to follow along and piece so much more together. If this were airing weekly and as spaced out as they were along with the limitations of cable TV and catching episodes in order, it does seem a bit daunting and could be confusing at some parts. Sure, there are plenty of episodes to just jump into and you'll be caught up, but on the other hand, there are so many episodes that rely on surrounding episodes to fully paint the picture of what's going on. So in hindsight, 
watching everything in a binging fashion made this a lot more easier to digest and fully enjoy, but that's just me. I would love to know how you prefer watching the series now versus back when they originally were coming out. Now, of course, there are still a few things to mention from the world of Ben 10 during the Alien Force and Ultimate Alien era, like the video games, where we see a lot more than just the technical two that we had for the original series. First, we have, simply titled, Ben 10 Alien Force, released on the PlayStation 2, PSP, Nintendo Wii, and the DS. It follows story moments from the show as well as current enemies we've encountered in the show thus far. The next game is Ben 10 Alien Force Vilgax Attacks. I own this one for some reason. I didn't know my Ben 10 collection was growing this fast. I don't have a problem. You have a problem. Releasing on all the same batch of consoles and the Xbox 360, the game pretty much does the same as the previous game, only now dealing with the later arc situations with Vilgax, hence the title of the game. Ben 10 Alien Force The Rise of Hex was a lot smaller of a game. Releasing on the Wii and Xbox 360, this game takes the more open map style action game and turns it into a 2.5D side-scrolling game. However, the next game, Ben 10 Ultimate Alien Cosmic Destruction, brings us back into the open map brawling, dealing with the Ultimate Alien stories coming out on the PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, PSP, Wii, DS, and the Xbox 360. But there is one final game that relates to this era of Ben 10, and honestly, it just may be the most important one out there. Ben 10 Galactic Racing. Yup, you heard that right. Ben 10 Galactic Racing is a racing game where you, your friends, and your enemies put down all that fighting nonsense for a bit and let off some steam on the track as you race in space. So that's pretty cool. It came out on all the above consoles minus the PlayStation 2 and PSP, and this time has versions on the PS Vita and 3DS. I do one day want to take a look at all these individual Ben 10 games over on my brand new gaming channel that is launching very soon, Jordan Fringe Gaming. Click the link below to check it out if you want to. I also want to give an honorable mention to a fun event that Ben 10 had, the Ben 10 10 10 Marathon. It was a five hour marathon of Ben 10 Ultimate Alien that would also premiere not just one, but two new episodes of the show. Starting October 10th, 2010, fans could tune in and watch a bunch of Ben 10 goodness, as well as enter in on a contest to win the Ben 10 Ultimate Prize Pack using codes that would be shown off on TV and plug them in on their website, www.ben10ultimateprizepack.com. Hmm, a lot of thought into that website name for sure. Runner-ups would win stuff like action figures, DVDs, and several other items, all Ben 10 related. The top winner, however, would take home a cash prize, a framed leather Ben 10 jacket, and much more. It was a pretty clever concept for a date that would only happen once every 100 years, and this one just happened to come by as Ben 10 was on the air. Wow, that was nearly 12 years ago at the time of making this video. Time really just keeps flying by, and I just really want that jacket. Whew, after after all of that, we have reached the end of everything that I am more familiar with when it comes to Ben 10. In my first video, I spoke on how my original viewing of Ben 10 while it was premiering stopped during Ultimate Alien, with me never experiencing Omniverse, and to that extension, the reboot. But back then, I had no clue that Omniverse was a direct continuation to everything previously, based on the complete redesign of the characters and the art design in general making Ben look and feel younger again, I just assumed Omniverse itself was a reboot. That's what I get for assuming. I couldn't have been further from the truth in that aspect. Here for both Omniverse and the eventual reboot following, the art style would drastically change. When it came to Omniverse, I never watched it as I thought it was a reboot itself, but come to find out years later that it does continue Ben's story after Ultimate Alien, just with a new art style. Everything here is all brand new to me. Clearly Omniverse is the most standout here as the art style is solely unique to this iteration of the series. Series, giving it a look that harkens back feeling slightly to Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated and Transformers Animated specifically, and there's a reason why. Because the character designs, the backgrounds, the colors for Omniverse were done by the person responsible for those shows as well, Derek J. Wyatt, giving Omniverse a very specific and distinct identity over any of the different series thus far. Sadly, Derek passed away back in 2021.
Already personally being a fan of Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated, I am highly looking forward to Omniverse and what it has to offer and enjoy the new look to the show which for everything we've already been through in the Ben 10 universe looks to be a fun ride. So let's explore the final part of Ben's story as well as the direction the show would take later on with the reboot, as well as what is next for Ben 10. Anytime guys. Being big fans of Ben 10 since the original series, Derek, along with writer, director, producer, and storyboard artist Matt Youngberg, would feel like a pretty good pair to oversee a lot of Omniverse. Both had worked on the previous series Ultimate Alien, with Matt directing a good handful of episodes and Derek doing some freelance work on the series. Now, with Derek moving up to leading the art direction of the series, he wanted to make sure no matter what it paid homage to the original series and the legacy Ben 10 was already building. One thing we have learned from past series is that thanks to Cartoon Network constantly having different eras of what the channel focuses on, whether it was the action cartoon era, the live action era, or the more modern era that would build out more after the incredible rise of both Adventure Time and Regular Show, Ben 10 was such a huge property to the network, bringing in more money and notoriety than most things not just on their network, but in general. Cartoon Network always had a plan to reinvent Ben 10 for the times knowing when to end the series and look to give the series a refresh when it returns. This also can stem from toy sales and reinventing the look of the show once again so your action figures and other various toy lines can get a refresh as well. Same characters, new looks, more sales. How could it go wrong, right? Well, it definitely, for the viewer, is a big leap. You're so used to one thing and while it's still the same in terms of advancing the same story, it is wholly unique in its approach. It probably led to a lot of people, like myself to not give it the initial time of day based on judging a book by its cover and thinking it's something else entirely. I got several comments on both of my previous Ben 10 videos mentioning similar experiences falling off of the series at this exact point. Omniverse, however, is such a large addition to finish off the Ben 10 series, and a surprisingly nice, well thought out, and well executed sci-fi finale that left me having a larger appreciation for Ben 10 overall. Premiering on September 20th, 22nd, 2012, lasting for eight 10 episode seasons, ending on November 14th, 2014, Omniverse is a bold and exciting end that gives fans of the series a payoff that may retcon a few things for the sake of telling the story the size of the universe, nay, the multiverse. Say goodbye to daddy. We start off Omniverse not far after the ending of Alien Force. Just kidding, we have a flashback first to young Ben 10 fighting Malware, an important villain who isn't impressed with the big savior Ben Tennyson. But when Ben turns into Feedback, a brand new alien, he seemingly easily takes him out. Then cutting back to five years later as Ben, Gwen, and Kevin are chasing down Zombozo. After also easily taking him down, Gwen and Kevin tell Ben that they are leaving. Gwen is heading to call early and Kevin is going with her. Ben at first tries to play it up that he can handle things on his own as an alien force of one, letting his returned ego take over his attitude towards them leaving. He continues this one-man army after visiting the plumber base under Bellwood, when an alert calls for attention and in a very cocky way tells Grandpa Max that he doesn't need any backup. He's him. I'm me. Yeah, that's what I said. Ben arrives at what seems to be a crater where a building used to be, as we see him being watched ominously by a mysterious figure. I mean, both of those things go together pretty well, I guess. As we will come to know that this is Kyber, the galaxy's greatest hunter, who has his eyes sought after Ben. Along with him is his mechanical canine, Jimmy Neutron Goddard.jpg. I'm sorry, Zed. When he sicks Zed after Ben, she transforms into a raging rhino-like alien as Ben gets the wrong alien to come out of the watch like usual. Nothing new there. Zed backs off as Kyber knows that Ben 10 will be his greatest catch to hunt down, and this is definitely not the last we'll see of these two, as we further will learn of their goals and reasonings for going after Ben. Through this little fella here, we learn that some other aliens are offering protection to these aliens and their businesses for a fee, but if they don't do that, then they are the ones that these aliens and businesses fear. Yeah, there's a literal alien mafia racket going on. As Ben investigates other businesses about this, Ben sits by to see how this 
racket is run, and once there is definitive proof, Ben sizes up the troublesome trio. And not before this other mysterious dude gives him some food to eat in every condiment you can ever want. What a nice random stranger that won't be a major surprise in just a few minutes. Once the battle starts, there is a lot of damage being dealt to the store, even though Ben is supposed to be the one helping them out from that not happening. The group end up placing a bomb in the store and running away after Ben becomes uh, Ben again. But just in time to save the day is this guy. Who is he? Good question. Oh, yeah, that, that's Rook, a highly trained and skilled plumber sent by Grandpa Max to aid Ben on this mission and become his new partner. Ben, however, keeps his attitude about being a lone wolf and tries to keep rejecting Rook from being his partner. But Rook's good nature keeps him around to help Ben and to constantly feed his ego. He's also got this really cool weapon called the Proto Tool. It can literally do just about everything, from being a blaster to a bow to a sword. Heck, it can scan QR codes and help you find parts in a crowded city if you really needed to. Oh, and then Ben turns into Blocks, a Lego Mega Blocks looking dude, as they take the bomb that they can't defuse outside and accidentally, or I guess not so accidentally, fling it into an abandoned building. But what it opens up after they chase the bad guys underground is a whole city underneath Bellwood called Undertown. Surely that was the best name that they can come up with, but the other options were pretty good too. As the chase heats up, we see just how skilled at this plot stuff Rook is, showing up Ben's clumsy nature with finesse at every encounter, and an all-too-serious attitude that makes him very kind and unaware of Ben's sarcasm. Lo and behold, that Kyber dude is still after them, sending out Zed once again as she is now transformed into another beast. Something's pretty special about that dog, I wonder what it is, saying that as if I wasn't going to answer that shortly anyway. After she gets called back off once again, the hunt for the other three mafioso aliens continue. We get to meet the head of the operation, Siphon, Vilgax's old push-around servant who now does his own things, like creating an alien mafia shakedown racket. Among other things he gets into throughout Omniverse, I mean, who needs Vilgax when you have Bill Gax? Yes, this is a real character. At the end of the day, the mission ends with Ben facing Zed once again and Rook going after Siphon, with both of them taking each of the bad guys out. And that is our introduction to Omniverse. It gives you that immediate same sense of feeling of what we've had before with Ben 10. The action, the humor, and all of that, but it lightly establishes where we are going to go. Even though Ben is not sold on having a partner, he quickly puts that aside and offers an open welcome to Rook as his partner, mainly because he got him some chili fries to eat since Ben was starving and all he wanted these past two episodes was just to get some food. But in general, he accepts him in as his partner. While their dynamic isn't quite there just yet between Ben's sarcasm and overconfidence and Rook's more serious and take what you say literally personality or I guess lack thereof personality. But that's why there is a whole series ahead that would build upon their relationship as partners and become a better unit overall. We also get to see a taste of some new aliens as well as a majority of the Andromeda aliens from Ultimate Alien Ben ends up using on accident for some reason. I mean, it's cool to see him again, but out of all the aliens, we get back to back to back to back these specific aliens, none of which came in handy for the situation, by the way. Except for Terraspin. Turtles are the best. Now, as opposed to the usual two or three larger story arcs, Omniverse features several that by the end of it all kind of focus back on one central plot. But before we go through this journey, let's talk about the new aliens of Omniverse. Wow! My turn! My turn! So aside from the obvious redesigns, which pretty much affect the look of all the previously known aliens that make an appearance here, there are still a lot of new aliens that get introduced in Omniverse. First and foremost, the first new alien we see, and easily the coolest and my favorite here in the new bunch, is Feedback. And what feels to me like a fusion of Static Shock and Freakazoid, his alien species is a Conductoid, and deals in, yeah you guessed it, electricity. Honestly, he's just pretty OP in any battle he's brought out for. Next there is Blocks. A segment to Sapien and he's just Legos. It's simple as that. But what makes him cool even if you may not like him since I've heard a lot of hate for this character is his shape-shifting abilities with the blocks. Gravitac, a Galilean, is a rock dude that has the power of 
Gravikinesis. For being this beastly creature with the body of the Tasmanian Devil, he can levitate, produce a force field, and oh yeah, he can generate black holes. This thing scares me. Ball Weevil, an unknown species, ooh, a mystery. It's just like a cute little beetle. A cute little beetle that can shoot freaking plasma balls at you, so that's pretty cool, yeah? Crash Hopper in Orthopteran is a powerful grasshopper-esque alien that has a strong, sharp head and can jump really well. If the superhero stuff doesn't work out for this one, the NBA could be a viable option. Astrodactyl, another unknown species. Okay, the plot thickens here. But come on, th this is just a pterodactyl. Except the wings are a jetpack. He's fast, is immune to gas, and deals in energy for its attacks. Walk a trout, an ichthy paramboloid. Yeah, yup, that, that's exactly what I think of when I see this slippery little fella. But I mean, come on, what's not to love? He has a strong little tail to go along with his strong little body. If feedback wasn't my favorite, this one might be, and for no other reason than. <laughs> look at the funny little blue fish. Now walk you down, now walk you. Mole stash, a Nigel Thornberrian. Him choking, it's another unknown species, but I think my name for it fits very well. But just look at how ready for work he looks. Just some dead eyes. Killer retro stash and he's a mole. His mustache though, seriously, is no joke. He can fly and it spins around really fast and I don't know, he just, he's cool. Pesky Dust, and Nimuna, is a little fairy that can enter your dreams and understand the secrets that you hold. Listen, Tim in Philadelphia, we all know what you did, and you won't get away with it. Kickin' Hawk, another unknown species, but you know what, I'm grateful for that because some of these names are getting really rough to pronounce, okay? Kickin' Hawk is a hawk. That can kick. Not much more to it, honestly. Topic is another one of those species unknown, but like, what do you call this? An ogre? Are we going to get kicked out of a swamp? Well, it does have a very scary face under that face city belt, so at least it has that going for him. Wampire, a Vladit, looks like if you mixed Batman Beyond and the Joker into one character. He can hypnotize people. Whoa. Why do I have this sudden urge to make chicken sounds? Gut Rot, a species unknown, has an upset stomach. He makes gas, okay? There's no other way to put it. That Mr. Toot Suit here sharts around the galaxies, saving them from evil doers while evil is brewing in his own tummy. Atomics, species unknown, is a walking natural disaster, and at best, a Dragon Ball Z reference. Bullfrag, an incursion, reminds me of a battle toad, cause he do be a very leggy frog, and he's got a long tongue. Last but not least is the worst. No, for real, that's his name. The worst. An Atrocian, the name fits. This dude is just in his underwear, and he's doing the whole Steven Universe belly button gem thing. And apparently, on top of all of that, he's indestructible. Neat. Omniverse, like I mentioned, has this non-stop rising action and stake building that previous entries in the Ben 10 series didn't perfect per se. While the previous stories and big overarching plot lines were really good, it always felt slightly disconnected, telling these different stories moving on from one to another, with the main connection just being Ben's overall journey. But in Omniverse, each and every major story moment builds upon the last, resulting in a story that feels a lot more focused that by the end of it makes the whole series of Ben 10 feel like it was planned out like this from the beginning, but that's because this series kind of makes it so. There's a few retcons here and there, but it still comes together very strong. Now, we already know that both Ben and Rook spend their time working together to become a pretty good fighting duo, which at first is definitely rocky with their personalities not always meshing together all too well, but it still offers a nice look into who Ben is now at this point in his life. He has this cocky attitude, and if anything, it is at an all-time high that can still frustrate viewers that there is little growth for him in that department. And ever since Alien Force, it feels like it's been a regression from the progress we had made there. Things for them don't start really getting interesting until they come across a Contamelia ship, floating above Earth so they go and investigate it. The Contamelia are essentially the creators of the universe? Those who were here before here was a thing? It's not so much that the ship itself that is interesting, but what's inside that is interesting. An Annihilarg, or the full name being this. Yeah, 
I'm not even going to try and pronounce this one, but it's a device that can create or destroy universes. Anyway, they aren't the only ones there, and plenty of others are after this device as well, leading into an extensive fight all the way back down to Mr. Smoothie. Man, this place just can't catch a break, ever. In the final moments of the battle for the device, it gets activated, and with no way to stop it from going off and destroying the universe, Ben transforms into Alien X, who now looks like the Crimson Chin or Jay Leno. Sorry, didn't mean to break the tension here. The Ben tension. Okay, I'll stop. But just like that, as he becomes Alien X, the universe is wiped out. This moment here actually kind of left me stunlocked. Like, this is the biggest and worst thing that has happened in Ben 10 thus far. We've always had threats of the universe ending, whether it be from the Omnitrix or other evil alien plans, but Ben usually saves the day before we ever get to this moment. So to see him fail in a way and everyone he knows and loves are being wiped out from existence is a pretty powerful moment that elevates Omniverse pretty heavily. Ben watches as the universe around him gets destroyed while he is in the mind space dealing with Serena and Bellicus for control of Alien X. Here he finally is able to start unlocking the possibilities of Alien X and the powers he can wield, convincing the other two voices that he needs the power of Alien X to recreate the universe and undo the destruction that has been done. In doing so, however, this recreation is not 100% the same as before, some slight differences, but for the most part, Part, the universe is put back together just as quickly as it was destroyed, showing the true unrivaled power of Alien X. When we return to the others who are after the device as well, give up on it actually working, thinking that it didn't do anything and they all just leave. Ben, however, tries to explain what actually happened over smoothies with the others, but they don't really believe that happened. I mean, to be fair, it's quite hard to believe that you no longer existed and everything was reset back to this moment as if nothing even happened and only one person and knows what actually happened. Even though Ben is in new clothes and Mr. Smoothie itself is slightly different, no one can really claim it was something else before, just things being the way they've always been. Which they are, but like... A couple things are different, I guess. I can't emphasize how much of a unique concept this is, especially since doing something so universe-altering may come with some future consequences. Foreshadowing? Maybe. Just, just keep watching, alright? I haven't slept in weeks. Fine! Don't believe me! Hey! No fair! You remember this guy, or thing from the five years ago flashback to the younger Ben 10? Well, he's back now and he doesn't just want the Omnitrix anymore, like every other villain in the series, but this time he wants to take down the creator of it, Azmuth. He also has help. That help is in the form of Kyber. Oh, hey, look, he's back. I told you we'd revisit him and his dog. Also, there's this dude, or doctor. Excuse me, sir. I didn't see the PhD, but yeah, this is Dr. Psychobos. Together, these three completely just wreck shop. First, this doctor here in Malware were able to create the ultimate defense against the Omnitrix, the Nematrix, a device that Kyber uses with his dog Zed or his other pet, a Pronuncian. What it does is transforms them into the little predators of the aliens within the Omnitrix to counter Ben's squad of aliens. I mean, just look at these. Some of these are menacing, and some are just whatever the heck this thing is. This whole concept just makes the battles that much tougher for Ben since these predators are direct species that go after the species of aliens Ben has in general. But why is Malware on this warpath? Well, before we meet him for the first time at the start of the series, he originally was born different from other Galvanic Mechamorphs giving off a yellow appearance and incomplete compared to the others on his homeworld, Gavin B, a moon that orbits Galvin Prime, aka Galvin Mark II, aka the home of Azmuth. Through his differences, Malware was promised by Azmuth that he would help fix him, but we all know Azmuth is a busy guy and his priorities usually lie elsewhere from smaller individual needs, leading Malware to become angered in the wait time, thinking that Azmuth only sees him as this failure of design and will toss him aside and forget about helping him. He finds a way to Galvin Prime and confronts Azmuth for the cure, but when Azmuth turns him down, he results to kidnapping his assistant at the time, Albedo. 
you know, before he was a Ben clone, but he brings him back to Galvin B, forcing him to use the cure that he also took with him to help him. Only problem is that the cure is unfinished, and Albedo was still good here, so he sabotages everything to take out malware. But all it ends up doing is making him more powerful than ever, changing him into his red look and making him a powerful mechamorph. So like, in a way, he was cured from his weaker frail state. From there, he tries going after the Omnitrix to become the combination of the two most powerful things Asmuth ever created. But during his fight with Ben back at the beginning of the series, he was able to get a partial DNA sample, which would be the next best thing as here is where the PhD man himself, Dr. Psychobos, comes into play. Already having a dislike of the Galvin race, it was a no-brainer for him to help out and team up with Malware to create their own version of the Omnitrix, the Nemetrix. And now they're in need of DNA samples. They reach out to Kyber in order to help hunt down the most ferocious and powerful predator aliens out there that counter Ben's aliens. This is now piecing together this interconnected villain puzzle. But remember how Ben used feedback to defeat Malware the first time? Well, Asmuth warns Ben about the use of feedback. Yeah, you can say that he was giving Ben feedback on using feedback, but I'm not a comedian and that wasn't funny. You came here for the cartoons, but you stay for the Jordan cringe, right? Right? Whatever. Feedback is ultimately hurting Ben's ability to use any of the other aliens. But in comes Malware for a surprise attack like a computer virus. Okay, yeah, well his name makes a lot more sense now. He essentially pulls feedback out of Ben's Omnitrix, leaving Ben with the new ability of no longer using feedback. Wow, that's not a very good power at all. Aside from that, let's cut to Malware, who exacts his ultimate plan by heading to Galvin Mark II. While Kyber and Doc Crab over there are keeping Ben and Azimuth busy, Malware literally blows up the moon, this being his own homeworld moon, Galvin B. And now he's able to absorb this power, becoming this giant hulking monster of Mechamorph and Ben can't defeat him. He's basically powerless. Even Way Big can't take him down, resulting in malware absorbing Ben inside of him. While things are looking pretty grim for Ben, during this time inside of malware, he is able to come to a realization and come to terms with himself, specifically over the loss of feedback, which was kind of like his favorite alien. I mean, just look at him. He truly just is the best. Here, Ben is able to restore feedback fully into his Omnitrix, so when he bursts out, he is able to actually take malware on with an alien who can finally do some real damage, resulting in malware being defeated. But his remnants may, dare I say, remained around for another day. But as time goes on throughout the series, Ben and Rook become a lot closer and work better together as they deal with other various threats and villains, like dealing with Albedo again. Because why not have a fun little encounter with him taking out Asmus' brain? Heck, at one point, Ben and Rook liberate the Inar system from Lord Transil. He's kind of like a vampire, hence the name. While all of these side stories do a fine job of providing entertainment as well as building the connection of these two characters, outside of this, their growth, and I mean more specifically Ben's growth, is still pretty non-existent. That same original charm of enjoying Ben just being Ben is still there. Every season has an overall theme or arc to it, making each season of 10 episodes feel self-contained but overall connected to one another with the complete rogues gallery of villains and other characters making a return. Charmcaster returns to attack Gwen at her college. Heck, just Gwen in general gets some more good episodes revolving around her at her school. Like in one episode called Mystery Incorporal, funny play on Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated because of Derek Wyatt, it involves Darkstar coming back and creating a cult and a plot that involves Gwen so he can access the Ledger Domain in order to absorb the mana there and become all-powerful. Then there's Kai Green, a childhood crush that Ben had had. They end up needing Ben and Rook's help because the Forever Knights are back and around to their old tricks again, now going after the Excalibur sword, which is hidden in Big Ben. They do show up a little bit earlier doing the whole erase all alien DNA thing, so even after what happened in Ultimate Alien, nothing's really changed. And speaking of the previous series, what happened to Julie? Well, her and Ben broke up, all because of some heated gamer moments while on the phone with Julie, with her misinterpreting what he's saying, and Ben not being aware of what he's actually saying. Saying. So now they're just friends. Good for you, Julie. You deserve better. Like Dean15. Who is he? I made him up.
okay, yeah, maybe all this Ben 10 in such a short amount of time is rotting my brain. I can't tell if that's in an actual good way or a bad way. There's even an episode in the fourth season that I mentioned before in my Secret Saturdays video where Ben gets visited by the Saturdays themselves when they come to Bellwood in pursuit of Chupacabra attacks being reported, coming together to take down the new team up of VV Argost and Dr. Animo, titled TGIS or Thank God It's Saturday where in which we get to see the Saturday's return, albeit with a lot of changes from their complete designs being redone as well as none of the voice actors returned, except for Argos. While it was great to see these characters again, it certainly had a different feel, but Ben does have a crush on Drew Saturday and I completely understand. There was also this incursion arc that brings in Atea, who brings back our favorite PhD alien, Dr. Psychobos, and they try and invade Earth. Princess Luma comes in for an attack and in that episode, we learned that Julie has a new boyfriend. Sorry, Dean15, you were just a little too late. All in all, Omniverse packed a lot of storylines, characters, villains, and interesting plots within each mini arc, or I guess mini season. And I was genuinely surprised that even if you can consider some of these stories as filler, they were all still pretty well executed in world building with legacy characters. I feel we get so much more of Ben 10 pumped into the series than ever before. The real excitement, however, ramps back up at the next big part of the story when Paradox shows up. and the multi Multiverse is at stake. It's your kids, Marty. Where we're going, we don't need roads. So get this. Remember our good old reoccurring villain who we've defeated over and over and over again, Vilgax? Well, he teams up with another foe who we've seen a few times here and there, Eon, the evil older Ben from a different timeline. Together, those two are time traveling around, putting together an army of literal evil variants of Ben 10 from all these different universes and timelines. For what, you may ask? For war of course, an evil alien's favorite pastime. Albedo is there because he hasn't learned his lesson in working with Vilgax before. Mad Ben, an ode to Mad Max because this Ben is Australian. A zombified Ben named Ben Zaro. A darker haired Ben who goes by Bad Ben. And of course, a gothic Ben named... I'm not even going to say this one. Now, this battle would take place on an alternate universe Earth, where the Ben that is native to it never found the Omnitrix because it never existed here in the first place. To confront Vilgax and Eon, Ben and Paradox assemble the good Ben Vengers, consisting of Gwen Ten. The Gwen from that one-off non-prime timeline Ben Ten story, where she gets the Omnitrix. Ben Ten Thousand from an alternate future who can literally mix and match his aliens together. And Ben Twenty Three. Oh, I forgot to mention Ben 23. Ben 23 is this Justin Bieber-esque alternate timeline Ben who, without guidance from Grandpa Max, falls into those fame and fortune temptations Ben Prime had and struggled with as a kid. If you thought Ben, regular Prime World Ben, was a lot to handle with his ego and his personality, well, you ain't seen nothing yet. Ben 23 is all of that, but to the max. Being a complete, self-absorbed, ego-driven, only doing the alien butt-kicking when it brings attention and admiration and he hates smoothies. Okay, that's where I draw the line, bud. Yeah, it's right there. That's a pretty good solid line. Unfortunately, this battle was just another distraction as Vilgax has this chronosapien time bomb that he uses to wipe out every Ben from every timeline, universe, or what have you. All except for this dude. This Ben has no watch, but our main Ben, Ben Prime, gives no watch Ben the Omnitrix before he disappears. Paradox steps in and grabs no watch Ben, but now has a watch Ben, as they travel back in time to the point in the prime timeline when Ben Ben first gets the Omnitrex, where we see a little bit of a retcon. Or was it? I don't know, decide for yourself. But instead of it going to Ben because of the close matching DNA, because of Xylene shooting it out and hopefully getting it to Max, the Omnitrix was guided to him from Paradox. And no watch Ben, but now has a watch Ben. There has to be a better name for him. Uh, let's call him Plain Jane Ben. That's a luxury watch joke for those who didn't get it. We end up eventually at the same spot, but instead of Plain Jane Ben being being in the mix, he is left behind in the space-time portal until Vilgax sets off the bomb, re-wiping out the Bens once again, and as soon as that happens, this last remaining Ben jumps out and is able to become clockwork and reverse the time bomb, bringing back all of the good Ben Vengers and sending home the evil Ben League of Doom, and hands back the Omnitrix to Ben Prime, and then they all beat up Vilgax. And can I just say, I am loving this. First we destroy the universe, and then recreate it, and 
now all the versions of Ben die, causing a retelling of how Ben 10 got the Omnitrix thanks to plain Jane Ben and Paradox, tying it into a time loop to the story as it was all supposed to lead to this moment. It would be crazy if they did that again, but on a larger scale later on, right? Well, I guess we'll see soon enough. All of that though was just the start to season six. The main arc of the season would involve something we briefly touched on in the last video, but we are gonna explore Kevin's past as it resurfaces. Ever been to summer camp? Okay, I wrote that pun before realizing that the title of the first Rooters episode is the same name. Parallel thinking, joke thief, who knows, but we're moving on. The Rooters themselves are a former special operatives division of the plumbers who created a separate faction all their own. Their main goal is to blow up and act like they don't know nobody. Their main goal is to eliminate Ben 10 as they believe he is not worthy of the Omnitrix, and he could be a major threat to the universe itself. However, the main person of focus here is Cervantes the leader of the Rooters who eventually runs into a young Kevin who has just stabilized his powers and uses his powers that he finds unique in an effort to literally take Earth children and fuse them with alien DNA to become some form of hybrid, thus creating the group known as the Amalgam Kids. He sort of tricked them into joining this secret ops group, advertising it as a haven for those who feel like outcast or have no family to turn to for help. He knew that he can morph these kids into hybrids by turning himself self into one. Yeah, that's why he's red now if you haven't noticed. Manny, Pierce, Alan, and Helen, who we've met in the previous series, all are here as we learn how they fully become the way they are. They would be sent on dangerous and morally messed up missions that Kevin put in perspective for himself, knowing that this was beyond the more juvenile and petty crime he was into. You know, the little things. And no, I'm not talking about Denzel Washington's movie. It's a form of expression. Keep up. It all came to a head when eventually the mission was to focus on Ben 10 and take him out as the group would be referred to as the Ben 10 Hit Squad. And through this, Kevin gets infested by the Omnitrix again and loses control of himself. As this project of his has now failed, he wiped the Amalgam Kid's mind and sent them free back into the Null Void. And now in the current part of the timeline, Cervantes caught wind of what Ben did in recreating the universe after, you know, it blew up. He tries going after Kevin in which Ben protects Kevin, but Kevin has no memory of him or why he'd want to come after him. Slowly though, he does recall these repressed memories. At the end of the season, they go after the rest of the Amalgam Kids to warn them before Cervantes comes after them. So while Kevin goes and gets Alan, Ben, Rook, and Gwen go round up Manny and Helen. Where's Pierce? Ow. Oh yeah, he uh, he died last series. Kevin wants to put an end to all of this, so in facing down Cervantes with Ben and the rest of the team following suit into the Null Void, Cervantes uses his controlling powers to make the Amalgam Kids fight for him against Ben and the others. But Kevin wasn't controlled yet. He eventually is persuaded by Cervantes based on the evils of Ben from their past, and Kevin transforms back into his monstrous form, ready to face off against Ben and the others. Eventually, however, after some pretty convincing fight that ends up leaving a permanent scar on Kevin's chinny chin chin. And chasing around the group, Kevin was never really persuaded and instead is in full control of his powers in this form now. He only was doing this to get close to Cervantes in order to strike him at the perfect moment and release control of the Amalgam Kids. And after defeating him, they leave him stranded in the Null Void. Man, Karma really is hitting this dude hard. It was a nice little arc to finally get some more information on Kevin's past. Learn about how these kids became these alien human hybrids and a nice finale to their group's story. We also get to see how far Kevin has come from everything he's been through. Even if he had us fooled in the first half, he really came through and saved the day for his found family that because of him, he feels responsible for the way they are. But like what I said about karma, it does come back around to everyone. Right before that confrontation, Ben's luck catches up with him as he has done so much that changes the state of the universe itself. Like the universe blowing up and then him making an almost exact replica of it. Like nothing ever happened. And I foreshadowed this earlier, remember? Well, it turns out that he was summoned to space court. It's like regular court, but it's in space to serve justice. Okay, fine, I'll say it's space justice. 
The Celestial Sapiens bring Ben to their intergalactic court on the grounds of interfering with the overall will of the universe and recreating it using the powers of a Celestial Sapien and violating the Multiversal Preservation Act. They initially find him guilty, but there is a way out of this that he opts for, and that is trial by combat against the Galactic Gladiator, and here Ben finally fully gets the control of Alien X Unlocked and is able to defeat the Gladiator, and the Celestials now understand that it wasn't Ben's sole decision decision alone, but through the actions of Serena and Bellicus, clearing his name and getting let off scot-free. And now everyone knows the truth about what actually happened, and no longer thinks his story is crazy. Is that a rare Ben W? But what is actually wild here more so than anything, is that there is an in-universe explanation for the show-changing art styles that can be applied in any way you look at it. Asthma's voice and appearance changed on at least three occasions. The Celestial Sapiens themselves have done essentially what Ben has done before and have interfered and altered the universe on many occasions. But it explains that the art style being different was the result of an interference from the Celestial Sapiens themselves. And you know what? That's so funny and such a fun fourth wall break to give closure as to why change the look. You know, aside from toys and all that. Wow, so far, Omniverse has done nothing but surprise me in the best of ways throughout the entire series. But alas, we haven't even explored the best part of it all yet. That is a valuable lesson. Last door on the left. What do you think of when I say the word scurred? Do you picture Squishy, the Zygarde cell from the Pokemon anime? Well, you should because that's kind of what you get, this little green octoblob looking thing. Originally planned for evil uses because of Kyber, Skurd ends up siding with Ben since the Omnitrix has more DNA samples to offer. He's a slime biote and are claimed to be extinct, but like, He's right there. Basically, Skurd feeds off of the DNA, attaching himself to the source or host without being able to be removed, unless, you know, he really wants to leave, I guess. Skurd is also pretty useful to the host, as he can adapt parts of the DNA into body parts, use their abilities, and become some sort of weapon or object based on said DNA being used. He's a cute little add-on that will impact part of the ending in a way. He's also a little sassy, and I can respect him for that. Speaking of the ending, Omniverse truly does something special and grand to wrap up the whole story of the series, since the reboot is, well, a reboot. This is it for the main story of Ben 10. So technically, we have already looked at the first part of the Time War, dealing with Vilgax and the Boom, and all of the Bens dying except for plain Jane Ben, and we even had a whole time loop. Our next part focuses on these two characters from the future, Exoskull and Subdora, whose mission is to search throughout time in the multiverse for the pieces of Maltruant and jumble Maltruant back into one piece. Throughout these time-traveling fights and efforts, Ben eventually ends up fighting alongside his future self son, good old Ken Ten. This mission isn't just something that has stopped then and there. We see this journey going all the way to a 36-year-old Ben, Ben 10,000, who is still trying to stop a fully put-together Maltruant, who is putting together his own corrupt version of the Annihilarg, for his goal of going back to the creation of the universe, the beginning of time, where everything started and fully having control and shaping it in his own vision. Now, in order to catch up with him and his dastardly plan, Ben Prime and Rook hop on a sick time-traveling motorcycle combined ship thing. Whatever it is, it's really cool, and if there's a toy of it, I want it. Eh. Close enough. Quickly, they are catching up with Maltruant, and once they do, they are able to knock him out of the time stream and into the 1770s, where they team up with none other than the one and only George Washington? All right. Sure. Maltruant sends out a distress call to his location of his crashed ship, leading us to the reveal of a young Vilgax who, in exchange for helping him fix his chariot of time travel, is gifted a Chronosapien time bomb. Hmm. Come to think of it, how did Vilgax get that time bomb from earlier in the show when he killed all those Bens? Perhaps this is all part of the time loop. But here is where we also get the understanding of why Vilgax has a never-ending warpath mission to get the Omnitrix from Ben, firsthand seeing what the Omnitrix is in the power that it holds, vowing that it will be his. Oh, and at one point, George Washington shoots an axe out of a musket thanks to the help of electricity when a lightning bolt strikes a kite that was attached to the musket? That's the only way I know how to describe what you are seeing right now. This is 
awesome. And also, Ben essentially invented the name of the plumbers, which George Washington was already a part of before the name change, as well as the idea of a president and him being one. I don't remember reading that in school. Maltruitt ends up hightailing it out and back into the time stream as our dynamic duo hop back in pursuit of him. At the end of the stream is an all-white void of nothing where they find a Contamelia ship, just like before towards the start of the series. On board, instead of Maltruant, Ben and Rook run into milkshakes? Well, not really. That would be just the weirdest and most random twist, but actually, it's the Contamelia themselves. Ben sees them as milkshakes as Rook sees them as his father. This is because these are beings of the fifth dimension and are able to form the appearance of whatever the individual is seeing them as what their heart desires most. Ben really likes his milkshakes. Maybe he's the one secretly funding the rebuilding of Mr. Smoothie after it's been destroyed just, just so many times over. They mention another guest on board, but they are not worried as they are running an experiment, which is just them creating a universe, you know, nothing too crazy for fifth dimensional dairy-based products here. In the chamber of the ship, Maltruin is seen replacing the Annihilarg already in place to create a universe with his corrupt one. And we even get to see how he sees the Contamelia, and it's just three versions of himself. Yeah, he's more self-centered than Ben 23, no doubt about it. I mean, maybe shaping the universe in your own image could have told us that, but this right here, yeah, this seals the deal. Skurd uses the power of of chromostone mixed with making a celestial sapient sword grow from Ben's arm, which is able to penetrate through the impenetrable barrier, but as the Annihilarg falls down into the white void, Ben dives after it in a last ditch effort, but it goes off. But luckily, this time he didn't fail. Ben was able to use feedback's power at first to harness the energy, but he wasn't alone. The power of every alien combined are able to hold it back, as Ben throws the Big Bang level of energy at Maltruant, which folds his mechanical beast behind into an implosion disappearing him from reality. Ben then steps on and crushes the device, leaving it shattered in pieces. The Omnitrix itself had a failsafe that wouldn't let Ben die, so at that last second gave him the strength to contain that explosion. Ben finally comes to the realization that no matter when the watch would give him the wrong aliens he thought he needed to get the job done, that somehow they were always the right alien anyway, with the watch knowing Ben more than he knows himself. The Contamelia offer Ben a chance to witness the birth of his own universe. How could you say no to that? So we see the start of time and space for this universe and the reveal of more slime biotes, as we learn that they are the building blocks of DNA to spread throughout the universe, creating diverse life within it. Skurd takes his rightful place to start humanity anew all over again. Paradox shows up and now they are left with the pieces of Maltruant to go and disperse them once again throughout the universe, understanding that now Maltruant is stuck in a time loop, destined to repeat the same cycle over and over again, meeting the same results and the same fate every single time. Ending with Ben and Rook looking rather bored with just doing, well, nothing. They just helped ensure the creation of the same universe they are living in now. So they have the idea of going off to explore the stars in which they just witnessed the birth of. Ben calls Gwen and tells her and Kevin to pack their bags as Ben says, We're going on a road trip! Thus ending the story of Ben 10. It all makes sense now. The whole story story of Ben 10 is one giant time loop. Everything is meant to happen as it happens and will repeat itself over and over again from Ben's start and end this story at the creation of the universe, symbolically ending back where Ben 10 originally begun, on a road trip. I guess it really all started when that alien device did what it did. I've so been looking forward to this. 
What is she doing here? This wasn't my idea. I thought it would be fun if your cousin came along with us this summer. I understand why it's called Omniverse. Why the art style changed. Why every event happened how it did. Why Ben was always protected in battle by the Omnitrix. The growth of Ben was not passed on his ego or personality, but in his ability to be exactly who he is. Being this stubborn kid with the weight of all of time being on his shoulders. He is his own creator, in a way. I don't just think that Omniverse is a good entry into the world of Ben 10, but a great one. It takes the sci-fi elements and cranks them up to 11 without sacrificing what made Ben 10 special in the first place. Sure, the intricacies are a lot more vast here compared to something like the OG series, but it only makes sense in hindsight, completing full circle the world of Ben 10. I wholeheartedly feel like this was a masterful way to tell the ending story, and maybe if the art style didn't change, more people like myself wouldn't have pushed it aside when they did, giving it no mind. Yeah, the art style isn't this art style, but it gives the show a new identity that I genuinely think is worth anyone's time. Oh, yeah, and before I forget, I did tease the remains of malware. Where did that come into play? Well, there was this one episode in the final season, Albedo again for some reason teams up with Vilgax as they steal the remains of malware in order to build a suit for him, but in the end, he really wasn't a match for Ben. Well, really scurred. But we will give Ben the credit here, it's fine. And that is Ben 10 Omniverse. A wild and ambitious entry into the Ben 10 franchise to finally put these stories of a boy with an alien watch to rest for good. Until it came time to cash back in on the property, baby. Yup, it's finally time after two years, the longest gap between Ben 10 series yet, Ben 10 would return in 2016. This time more different than ever before. Let's talk about the reboot. We're going on a road trip! Aw, oh, come on, Grandpa. All right, all right, I know, I've seen the comments. There are some very, very strong opinions about this iteration of the show, and trust me, I totally get that. Luckily for me, this is new territory, and I am going into this fifth installment in the Ben 10 franchise completely blind aside from knowing what the art style and designs now look like. So if you've never experienced the reboot yourself, consider this your guide to come along with me. It will be fun to explore what this is. And if you don't, I'll never make another long form retrospective series like this again. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. <clears throat> anyway, uh, in June of 2015, Cartoon Network had announced that Ben 10 would be revitalized and brought back in a new way, getting our first official look at this reboot at San Diego Comic-Con in 2016. Ben 10 The Reboot would come out two years after the end of Omniverse. Well, not for everyone, if you happen to live in other regions of the world like Australia, New Zealand, or within the Asia Pacific region, then you would get to see the new Ben 10 series months in advance in October of 2016. For the US, however, we would eventually get the series in April of 2017. The reboot would end up running for a total of four seasons, three specials, one movie, and a major feature in a crossover event. Hmm, I wonder which one I could possibly possibly be referring to that I totally don't mention in any of my Cartoon Network related videos. Right off the bat, this show is different. And we spent time in each video here discussing how Cartoon Network would navigate these changes to never go too long with something where it can get stale, as well as adapting for the current cartoon landscape. At this point in Cartoon Network's history, like it or not, since I know it is a very opinionated topic, but the majority of cartoons that found the most success on the network basically fell into a similar art style and aesthetic. But more importantly, it's how these type of shows work. No longer is Ben 10 a 22 minute show. It is now done in 11 minute segments where the medium of animation on Cartoon Network is mainly at. Teen Titans Go! focuses on a whole side market that most people overlook. Aside from endless all-day marathons of the show, that's not even scratching the surface with its secondary market. Online virality. Small 30-second to 2-minute clips that can be posted on YouTube or shared on Twitter. They quickly understood the short-form quick bits of content that the internet would quickly adopt, from Vine to TikTok to YouTube Shorts, the content online that everyone can digest in mere seconds and easily share to a friend. Heck, just the other week, Teen Titans Go! had a viral clip of the newest episode that premiered that day float around Twitter trending because of how much it was being shared around and talked about. But that's just an example of what happens on a larger public scale when more people get to see it. Under the hood, 
Cartoon Network has channels on YouTube that solely pump out these clips of shows like Teen Titans Go or the Ben 10 reboot. Because it doesn't just promote the show, it's getting more bits of the show out there directly to where the audience spends its time more and more. Ben 10, while having major success with the legacy it had built up over the past four installments, wouldn't be as easily ingrained into this current landscape. So this new Ben 10 would fill that void. Now, I want to be clear, none of that is indicative of the quality of the show. Rather just something that plays a factor into the production of everything overall. In fact, I think how they went about using their Ben 10 YouTube channel aside from clip posting was pretty cool. Starting in 2017, they would post these Alien of the Week videos as a part of their Alien World series, giving us a deeper look at the lore of the aliens themselves. A fun way to give newer viewers a peek into more information not really given out within the show itself. Speaking of the show itself, when we first meet up with Ben again, or I guess since it's a reboot for the first time, we just jump right into him already having the Omnitrix, but still being very new to having it, not knowing the full capabilities that it holds. He is still very inexperienced, and rather than just kicking butt, he uses the aliens at his will for, well, whatever. We do see similar aliens return, albeit with new looks for the majority of them, and the newest member of the initial 10 being Overflow. Throughout the series, we would get introduced to a larger roster of more familiar faces, but a few new ones too, like Shock Rock, Slapback, and Surge. But what this series does differently is the origin of Vilgax. Ben has this powerful alien called Gax, which he gets at the end of season one, where we see a familiar face we the audience know come back to the series, Tetrax, along with other bounty hunters just like in the original series. But here they are after the watch for other reasons. The watch is acting up and through a chance encounter, an alien named Vil shows up and offers a form of mentorship. But Ben eventually catches a whiff of ulterior motives, and this Vil character is able to help Ben transfer back into Ben, and extract the Gax DNA from Ben's Omnitrex, and to no one's surprise, Vilgax is revealed, as the combination of both Vil and Gax. Shocker, no one saw that one coming. What's more interesting here is the backstory of Vilgax being this way, being separated into two entities so his powerful Vilgax form can't be unleashed, which is why Tetrax was after the Omnitrix in the first place to prevent this from happening, not to just solely attack Ben. And in the end of this first real encounter with Vilgax, Ben's watch issues cause him to rapidly switch through aliens, and he's able to take him down, at least for now. Throughout this reboot, we see so many familiar faces with new interpretations of the stories you and I already know from watching previous Ben 10 series. It's switching up everything we know, or we thought we knew, but not in ways that don't make it at least slightly fun, as it's not rehashing everything from before and instead trying a few new things. From Darkstar to Charmcaster, Billy Billions to Zombozo, Dr. Animo to Hex, we get some fun encounters with these villains or antagonists, but what sticks out more to me than seeing these characters again, and to point out what's changed about them from previous iterations, is the fact that Ben, Gwen, and Grandpa Max are just a bit off. Now, that sounds harsh, and I don't mean that to be. Ben is still the Ben that we've known, personality-wise, but when it comes to how him and Gwen interact, it's a lot more evident in what I mean. Ben is a lot more open to Gwen. Sure, they still have their banter, but it's not targeted in a mean way towards one another, rather more playful and usually ending up at the expense of themselves when making these comments. Gwen is a lot more, I guess, supportive is the right word I'm looking for here, often being less analytic and more cynical at Ben's expense, but actually supports him in these alien adventures. It surprisingly works well as we spent so much time with them as characters before having such a different relationship. And it's kind of nice and a bit heartwarming that rather than being at odds constantly, that they truly are on the same side here, allowing the smaller 11 minute runtime to focus on the limited story it can tell, or save room for jokes. There's a lot of jokes here in this series, as it clearly is trying to be set up more in line with other cartoons on the network. 
We follow Ben and Gwen around in the rust bucket just like the original series with Grandpa Max taking them around the country. And there's just something about Grandpa Max here that screams Disney to me for whatever reason. I think it's the face or the shape of the head. I don't know how to describe it other than it just feels different for sure. But also because of the voice acting as well. For Ben, Tara Strong does make a return to voice young Ben. But for Gwen, we have Montse Hernandez. And for Grandpa Max, we have David K. Throughout the show as well, we see Ben do something solely unique to this series, which is break the fourth wall, explaining certain things directly to the audience or to emphasize a point. The show itself is a lot more silly in nature, opting for more jokes over a deep, rich narrative. And that is not to say that there isn't that here, because there definitely is a taste of that, but that more so starts to ramp up towards the later seasons, as the main problem that I find with the show becomes a lot more clear. Still hungry for action? Nah. The show has this one glaring issue that feels present in almost every episode, especially when you get to the end of the series and see where it's at, versus how the series started. It wanted to be more like the playful joke-based cartoons on the air at the time, but it still wanted to be Ben 10. The reason the original four series worked so well played off making sure that the story was engaging, and that the comedy often came from the character interactions and their personalities, rather than outright slapstick or random circumstances. Now with the average runtime cut in half with only certain major narrative plot points grouping together for a block of several episodes, the show doesn't have the luxury of that proper divide to be like the other series. But that's not me saying that it has to be like the other shows, just solely looking at what the reboot is and what it offers. It never felt like I'm on this journey with these characters, but more of a peek into random days of their lives. Sometimes things would be simple and not much really happens. Some days it's giant alien monster battles. It focuses on keeping things simple, but maybe too simple sometimes. I think as far as the show looks in general, I'm okay with the new art style as I now have gone through my adjusting to Omniverse looking different phase and can look past what feels unfamiliar in that sense. The colors are vivid, the animation has a nice flow to it, and I think both Ben and Gwen specifically have a bit more pizzazz with their new looks. We even go back to Kevin being a bad kid, mostly being a bully towards Ben and eventually we see him create his own version of the Omnitrix, the Antitrix, because why not? Their relationship is basically that of a rivalry, and you do see more of these moments of Kevin wanting to or willing to change. Yeah, part of that once again is because of Gwen. But the kicker here for the series was the major focus on the toy market in association to the series, constantly adding some sort of new additional quote unquote gimmick that can be applied to the toys as here in comparison to the previous series are selling like hotcakes. Picture the powers of the Omnitrix, but it only makes the aliens more powerful, kind of like ultimate forms, just, you know, something else new that can sell more toys. In the second season, we get introduced to Omni-enhanced versions of the aliens. It was this additive blue energy that alter the looks of the aliens slightly, as well as add that blue glow to them, giving them more power in battle, and literally a new toy line to match. Cartoon Network at this point with Ben 10 knew what worked and what didn't work in that part of the market and made sure that they had the right juice, the right Omni Enhanced juice, to hit this reboot with the real money makers like Ben 10 hadn't already made them billions, baby. Or in season four, bringing in Omni Kicks enhancements, which add this high tech armor to the aliens. And we haven't even touched upon what happened in the movie yet. From here, we would get everything in toy form. I mean, from the characters, side characters, the aliens, the other forms of the aliens, the RV, other vehicles. Man, this rust bucket really reminds me of this vintage Jurassic Park, the Lost World toy. I had it when I was a kid and it's worth a lot more money now. And I fulfilled that need of needing it back and bought it. Yes, I'm an adult. But the reboot of Ben 10 wasn't just done after four seasons. Like I just said, there was a movie that would come out shortly after the end of the fourth season in October of 2020. Go!
What's a Ben 10 retrospective series episode without talking about some sort of movie, right? Well, at the end of the Ben 10 reboot's fourth season, we were given Ben 10 vs. the Universe, where Ben really doesn't feel too much of a challenge anymore facing down these enemies, since he is easily taken down pretty much every threat. As they get a call from Phil, ugh, I never even mentioned Phil. Look, all you gotta know is that he's a longtime friend of Max, and he can fix things really well. He also has an AI son. Phil brings them into his home base, located in his garage, and alerts them to a meteor that is on a collision course with Earth, threatening to take out all life on the planet. Ben, being Ben, thinks that the only way to stop this meteor is to go in all Armageddon style, and then just punch it or blow it up or something. Timely, I am talking about this, as in real life, we just successfully collided a satellite into an asteroid in a test effort to see if we can alter the course of oncoming meteors or asteroid threats. This was like the coolest thing I have seen in my lifetime, and we no longer need to send up Bruce Willis backed by the sounds of Aerosmith into space to stop it. But no, the internet's too busy doing anything else to care about it. What we just did was history, and it was so cool and like three people care. Didn't Bill Nye ever teach you that science rules? Before Ben goes up to space, Phil lets him know that turning the dial more on the Omnitrix after his upgrade that brings forth the Omni Kicks armor, he can unlock an even more cooler and secret powerful upgrade to all of the aliens that adds on the omni Knot armor. You know what that means. K-pop! What? No, Casey. Toys. It means toys. When Ben heads directly for the meteor, he seemingly loses control and is forced around the meteor and is sucked into a portal that opens in space. As the meteor is still heading towards Earth, we do get this touching moment with Max, Phil, and Gwen as she is panicked over Ben's disappearance. They hold each other and embrace for the impact that will end the world. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. And it turns out that the meteor wasn't a meteor at all, but a pod that still crashes on Earth with some slight forest damage that contained Vilgax, who steps out of the pod. Ben, however, finds himself floating in space and intercepted by a ship full of these frogmen. These aliens think that Ben is Vilgax in disguise, and they capture him for his crimes. Max and Gwen are going to the site of the crash in hopes the signature that they have in their following is Ben, but they end up running into Kevin, who is dealing with some issues with his anti-tricks. And we get a nice moment that bonds Kevin closer to Gwen and Max and comes with them in hopes that Phil can help repair and fix those issues with his device. Ben, in space court, once again, like he was in Omniverse, is being framed by Tetrax with old footage of Ben using Gax before Vil took it out of him. You know the story already. No one believes Ben's pleas of letting him go, so that he can go and stop the real Vil Gax from destroying more worlds, and they end up trapping Ben in the null void for life as punishment for his crimes that he did not commit, but Ben gets a weird message on his Omnitrix while he's there saying he is not worthy of using the device, as the voice claims to be the creator of. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. I do like that Kevin starts being good and enjoys getting praise from Max, but this nice moment is quickly ruined when Vilgax shows up, and as an explanation of why Kevin had the dream to build the Antitrix, it was planted in him by Vilgax and in order for Vilgax to come and take it from him without having to do the hard part of, you know, building it himself. So naturally they fight. Ben deals with some familiar alien races from previous series, which are nice to see here, as Ben fights as hard as he can to prevent them from stealing the Omnitrix. But Azmuth shows up, and they're all scared off. But now Azmuth wants the Omnitrix and just rips it off of Ben, tells him that he's the inventor of the device and that it was never meant for Ben in the first place. We get the reveal of Vilgax being a student of of Azmuth, and originally the watch was meant for him, which explains why he wants it so bad in this series. Ben, wanting to know more, just annoys Azmuth until he tells him the backstory of what actually happened. From the creations he would make and not worry about the consequences or repercussions of them, we discussed how these have played a big factor in the original series and in the follow-up older Ben series. It's hard not to compare, honestly, as everything here is completely different in a lot of ways, but we have to remember, this is is the reboot continuity now. As far as we're concerned, nothing else should or could affect the story here. We learn that Azmuth was the one that split Vilgax partially into the Omnitrix to stop him from using the device as a warlord and sent it into a planet he deemed to be, well, not the brightest. 
never intended for an Earth kid to be the one who finds it and wears it. But Asmus still refuses to give Ben back the Omnitrix after the story, which Ben exclaims, watch or no watch, he's gonna find a way to get out of here and go defeat Vilgax and save his family. Which sparks a bit of curiosity with Azmuth as to maybe this kid isn't just some random weakling not knowing what he's doing with the watch. So he sets a timer and places the device back onto Ben's wrist, telling him he can continue to use it only if he can pass the trial he has set for him. He must reach Azmuth before the end of the timer, but it's not as simple as it seems. Through this trial, Ben learns more about how the Omnitrix works. Having more control over it, he uses his remaining time for a selfless act to help one of the other aliens in the Null Void, and because of this, and him learning about the device on his own, he grants him a chance to leave and head back to Earth with the watch, as Asmus stays behind as a form of self-imprisonment. Ben also notices on his way back that the whole court who imprisoned him was getting sucked into the Null Void, so he saves them, and then they realize that Vilgax would never do something like that. Back on Earth, Vilgax is able to rip off the Anti-Trix from Kevin, strapping it to his own wrist, becoming an all-powerful alien. Anti-Vilgax. Putting everyone in danger with no proper way of fighting back, unless Kevin had something, like a car or whatever. Oh, yeah, that helped. He's, he'd probably be a really good mechanic one day. For Ben's efforts saving the ship from the Null Void, they apologize to Ben and help him get home. Kevin combines with Glitch and basically becomes Iron Man to keep the fight at bay from the others. And Vilgax plants his mechamorph tentacles into the ground, changing the land around them, terraforming the Earth into Vilgax's own ideal land. At the same time, Ben confronts Tetrax, before he can escape as he finds out who he was paid by to lie in court. It was Azmuth himself in a way to get Ben to Azmuth. He ends up letting Tetrix go peacefully to escape custody, and when this guy finds out that he isn't there, he says this. We'll find him. If not now, then perhaps in the next reboot. Now that was the funniest thing said in this entire Ben 10 reboot. It was all worth it for that moment right there. As things look grim on Earth, Ben comes in hot like a meteor ready to join the fight. Vilgax needs that upgrade key inside Ben's Omnitrix, and Ben, he just needs to be a hero. But this is Ben 10. He always finds a way to stop the bad guy, but surprise, Ben is on the brink of failing, and Kevin swoops back in just in time to get the Antitrix. But it wasn't in time enough, and Vilgax absorbs the power, becoming a being of ultimate power. Alien V. Yes, the V stands for Vilgax. Do I know that for sure? No. But do I believe it does? Yes. Ben and Kevin now have to work together in this final brawl, but sadly, this isn't working. But Azmuth offers some wisdom to Ben from the test he just endured, bringing forth way big from the watch, a nice homage to the original secret of the Omnitrex Vilgax, way big fight. The music quiets down. The rain fills that silence as these larger-than-life titans fight. Ben is able to defeat Vilgax as Space Justice comes to wrangle in Vilgax, and Azmuth just lets Ben keep the Omnitrex, ending with the road trip continuing on to Nebraska. Oh, so this is the sequel to Versus the Universe. Okay, where was all of this action and storytelling within the majority of the reboot? Clearly, towards the later seasons and then in this movie, the direction would start to shift more into this. And I like this. This gave me the feelings and excitement of the previous Ben 10 series. Sure, there was still a bunch of jokes, but it never really felt restrained from giving us that sci-fi storytelling. Some pretty fun action and a satisfying narrative to wrap pretty much everything up. While this version of events dealing with Azmuth and Vilgax may not be as good as how they were pre-reboot, it was still pretty interesting to see these big reveals happen in this series. But as far as the Ben 10 reboot, that is all there is. Just kidding, after the movie, things get even spicier with three more specials containing some pretty wild stories. Cheater, cheater, lion beater. After the movie, in April of 2021, three specials would come out back to back to back for three days. First starting with Ben 10,010, where we start off in the future as an invasion of Earth is taking place by the Zerg. President Gwen, along with her general Hex, try and begin preparations to fight back against the attacks. 
Her press secretary is none other than Zombozo. I don't know what's going on here, but hey, I'm I'm here for it. We learned that there was some sort of falling out between Ben and Gwen some time ago, and the stakes of this battle will need to bring them back together. Her sergeant is Steam Smythe, another past villain, and Grandpa Max hasn't aged a day uh, because he's dead, and this is just his consciousness on a computer now. There is no wasting time in this episode. The action rises quickly, and the fight for Earth begins with Gwen putting up a strong fight all on her own. Hex brings Kevin to the fight, making it a future reunion for the ages. But when the battle ends, they know another wave is soon on the way. And here we see the future hero event. Well, that certainly wasn't expected. He can't even fully transform too easily into his aliens. He's quite disheveled, and we don't even know what caused this future to happen. What separated Ben from the rest of his family? We get a taste of this when we find out that Grandpa Max is a hologram from something Ben blames himself for. That's some pretty heavy stuff. I just find it funny that everyone working at the White House or in a position of power in the government is a bad guy. I am not going to make a joke here. The Zerg being here are blamed on Ben due to the Omnitrix calling them. The only way to stop this threat is by Ben going back in time before any of this started. He would have to go back to when Max was still alive and Ben and Gwen were kids. Young Ben is in a fight with Steam Smythe as a new alien gets unlocked in his watch. The same X-shaped alien he names Surge. After the fight, older Ben brings younger Ben into the future as they both turn into Surge to take away piece by piece the giant amalgamation Zerg manifestation. At the end of the day, saving the day. This also brings back together future Ben and future Gwen from their differences and issues that separated them in the first place. It also gives Ben the confidence to put the right foot forward and become that hero again. Donning that sick green jacket and ready to bounce back, it's all in all a fun little extra story that felt like a fun walk down memory lane with all the past villains. With them really not being villains, it nicely subverts expectations that give you a satisfying end and a hopeful future for Ben as an adult. Our next special would bring back a character, but not one from the world of Ben 10, but someone who has interacted with Ben before, Generator Rex. Another man of action creation that I absolutely love. Here though, for this special titled Ben Gen 10, they spent about two minutes coming up with that title, but regardless, summer vacation is quickly coming to an end. And while their traveling journeys bring them to Washington DC, Ben S'more starts talking to him. What the, what is happening? I'll just be in therapy about this, but before Ben eats the s'more, Rex and Bobo Haha -ha steal it and split and eat the s'more, which angers Ben as Cannonball, which they mistake for one of their bad guys from their show and think he's an Evo. So a fight breaks out and Rex hopes that his powers will work, similar to Ben hoping his watch doesn't let him down. And I don't know if it's just the new art style for Rex and him being a lot smaller and seemingly younger, but this sword looks huge compared to how small Rex is, and I just find it very funny. Ben's Omnitrix gets all scattered thanks to the nanites from Rex and shoots out all of these alien powers onto civilians around him. And then eventually everyone around the, uh, I don't know, this area is a big population. Th this is a nightmare. It's even affecting his loved ones. A massive ship touches down as we get to see Agent Six come around trying to contain Ben as he is the source of the outbreak. Rex steps in to fight with Ben against Agent Six who is trying to capture Rex as well. Hex is around to cause even more mayhem being able to control the people who are now aliens. So Ben, Rex, and Bobo all fully team up. Six is ready to annihilate the outbreak of aliens or evos or whatever they think they are at this point. Hex though is in control and surrounds them all, forcing Agent Six to trust in Ben and Rex to come up with a plan to reverse everything and if it can work, he'll call off the termination. They end up coming together in the same way that this accident started and are able to transform everyone back into humans. They defeat Hex and he gets put into custody. While this episode is silly fun and we get to see, at least for me, some characters I really enjoy, they really aren't the same as the story here is not really the same as Generator Rex proper. 
so it's kind of whatever. I also don't feel like it's some sort of secret backdoor pilot to reinvent Generator Rex in the same way the Ben 10 reboot did for Ben 10 in general. I like it, but that doesn't mean I want more of it. I hope it just stays as this little end of the series special. Also, Ben questions how Agent 6 got his title of the sixth most dangerous man on the planet, which I've asked that too. Where, how, and who measures that metric? Our final episode special for the Ben 10 reboot, and probably most important one, is Alien Extinction. Here, it's just more Ben and Grandpa out camping in the woods like usual just without Gwen. But then, a Celestial Sapien shows up looking for a fight and steals Ben's Omnitrix and a different Max shows up to help them recover from the attack, telling him that his Omnitrix is gone forever. We follow this Max back to his ship as we hear him call this Celestial Sapien Alien X and that different dimensions of Ben's have been targeted. We see another universe Ben in a battle with Zombozo, but after that fight, Alien X shows up and starts whipping butt. And the original opening with just Ben and Max clue us in to Gwen being at summer school, so that wasn't our Ben reboot prime. This current Ben we are following is the main Ben. He is struggling with not being able to shine as the standout one in these battles, since he has the alien powers but feels overly aided by Gwen and Max which leaves us with some awkward silence between them for a moment. The traveling through dimensions Max shows up to explain that Alien X is traveling the Omniverse collecting the Omnitrixes from Ben's, and in this Max's case, killing off his Ben, who was in the art style of the Omniverse series. When Alien X catches up with them, we truly get to see how dangerous and all-powerful Alien X is is. He's basically undefeatable. After all this time, over all the series, we would only get some cool moments and glimpses into Alien X and the Celestial Sapiens. Alien X successfully takes the watch and leaves, which thanks to the failsafe on Ben's watch, as not all Omnitrixes have it, it didn't cost Ben his life. While figuring out what needs to happen next, a portal opens up, and out walks Chromastone, who turns out to be another Ben, this time a Ben that represents the Alien Force era. This Ben talks about the plumbers, which our main reboot Ben and Gwen do not know about. Shouldn't you be called, like, Alien Force or something? Man, they really saved a lot of these good jokes right for the end of the show. And now having a Ben who can travel the Omniverse, they set up a plan to travel, find another Omnitrex, and bring it back. So it'll be two Bens against one all-powerful god, essentially. Yeah, I'm sure nothing will go wrong. While waiting for the traveling Max to come back, they try and rig up some traps in a closed amusement park. But Alien X shows up before the second Omnitrex is brought back, and all of the traps aren't really holding him off, so it's basically working as a distraction for now. Then Max returns with another Ben, this time from Ultimate Alien alien who has the ultimatrix. This begs the question though, which Ben is the real prime version of Ben? It's a fun discussion because of all the consistencies and references, but adding on all of the small details that don't add up make it debatable if these Bens we see are even the same Bens we've known from the past series. The Omniverse is vast and can be full of very close variants of Ben 10 that are meant to just give a fun throwback to the previous eras. Is Reboot Ben our real Ben? Still, at this point, they are no match for Alien X, so they decide that they need as many remaining Bens who still have their watches to come in for backup for the fight. As Reboot Ben goes with the other Max to find more Bens to easily convince them to come over and help them, he quickly returns with a few more Bens, or two Bens, one Gwen. One Ben that resembles the OG series Ben, another one that is supposed to represent Omniverse, unlike the other one who did too, but you know, he got it when he killed off. And of course, making her appearance all the way from that one non-canon alternate episode from the original series that is canon, it's just in a different dimension, Gwen 10. All of the Bens learn to work together, all ages, all different versions coming together it's hero time. Oh look, it's Pokemon the first movie. They all attack together at once and are able to remove Reboot Ben's Omnitrix so he can join the fight becoming Heat Blast as he calls him a classic, referencing Heat Blast being the first alien we ever meet in the entire franchise. Eventually they are able to pull off a bunch of the Omnitrix from Alien X. 
with one left to go as he gets captured and then turns back into a Ben. A Ben that had went down a path of doing everything on his own rather than having a team and others around that have your back juxtaposing reboot Ben's wishes of not having a team at the time. His story of becoming this way is losing Gwen and Max in a fight with Vilgax by them trying to join in on the fight after he told them he could handle it. This loss sparked him to be this hardened solo savior of the Omniverse. And if he lost everything, why should every other Ben not have the same? The other Max offers an extension of family, mentioning a second chance to have a family again, while still having to pay for his crimes with a bit of time in the null void will go by quick. This Max no longer has that family of his own, so it would be a good fit to give them both a second chance together. Even if this Ben killed this Max's Ben, you can assume that it all takes place within one giant omniverse with infinite possibilities. And the Ben we could be following is only a prime Ben within this reboot version of the show, while our other prime Ben could be the prime Ben from a different dimension, and we only consider who we are technically following as our definitive prime Ben. Who's to say that there is no prime timeline? It's just the Ben we are given to be our vessel into the world itself. Whiteboard, how we feeling? Yeah. That's easy to understand. Thanks. Overall, it's a really fun episode that does a good job at being the finale to the reboot, showing love and respect for all of the years and series of Ben 10 that came before, from the writing and how the jokes play into the absurdness of it all, to the fun story, it was a very nice send-off for the franchise as a whole. Plus, I just love the duality of Grandpa Max's here. The reboot Max being this non-aggressive, pretty chill, and ultra-nice guy, and the other Max being this hardened fighter who doesn't have patience for anything, mostly speaking with a more aggressive and assertive tone. And our original Prime Grandpa Max from the OG series was kind of that perfect middle blend of these two. In the end, whether you enjoy the reboot of Ben 10 or not, the show can still be seen as a possible alternative timeline to the original series, or just a standalone reboot, both playing by the rules set up in the previous iterations of the show, and being something all its own. That's kind of the beauty set up within the world of Ben 10. And in other words, of course I have to mention the OKKO OK Let's Be Heroes crossover Nexus event, where aside from all the other cameos within that we've talked about before, one of the main characters in this special is the reboot Ben himself, with the Omnitrix turning him into other legacy Cartoon Network characters to deliver a powerful blow during the final battle. Y you know I just couldn't resist mentioning that. Where is everyone? Now, while I may have had fun discussing both of these iterations of Ben 10 and myself personally really liking Omniverse, back when these two series both came out, there was a big split that started to happen within the fan base. Omniverse was criticized by fans for toning the show down in an effort to keep it at a younger audience level, as well as trying to inject more humor into it. Plus, the retcons also pushed fans away because messing with the continuity can sometimes be a big turnoff. And while some like myself don't overall mind most of the changes in favor of getting the ending we got with Omniverse, for others, it hindered their experience. And whether you like that or not, you are valid in your opinions. And while a reboot is a reboot, the original series fans are always going to have a form of comparison between the two, even if they are trying to go in it with an open mind. I personally don't love a lot of what the reboot had to offer, but it was never too offensive towards the original series. In fact, it worked hard to always show love to the classic continuity, but with so many decisions in the show, even when they are taking stories to adapt and redo them, do feel like the focus was too far away from what Ben 10 was. Albeit, the later half of the reboot and the ending specials do feel like a nice reward for making it through the tonal issues the show faced. But with this back-to-back -back combo of fans no longer being interested, the sales for Omniverse toys were heavily affected. The reboot was okay because of a new audience that it captured, but after such a a major buildup for many with the original series Alien Force and Ultimate Alien, there was a significant fall off from the franchise, at least going forward. The OG fanbase still loves and supports the majority of the prior, choosing to stay at the higher points of the franchise and not explore the perceived lower points. Ah! Get away from me! 
Now, of course, there were games for both Omniverse and the reboot. First, there was Ben 10 Omniverse that released on the Nintendo DS, 3DS, Wii, Wii U, Xbox 360, and PlayStation 3. It was your typical action beat-em-up that had a two-player element to it, since you have Rook with you, either controlled by the computer or by another person. There was Omniverse 2, which was essentially just more of the same, being a direct sequel and all that. Only this time, it did not release for the original Nintendo DS. For the reboot, there was a self-titled Ben 10 game released for the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch. It played most similar to like a Skylanders game as you traverse some basic level designs and beat up some bad guys with the ability to transform into his first 10 aliens in the reboot. The second reboot game, Power Trip, adds a lot more of the characters, enemies, and more from the series coming out on all the same consoles as the last one, and plays more as a platforming beat-em-up with more of an open world to traverse and explore. And maybe one day I'll even deep dive these games further on my brand new Jordan Fringe Gaming channel. Look, I already have a brand new video over there right now. Check it out after this one. Now, as we round out our long multi-dimensional journey here, from the show to the games to the toys and much, much more, to say Ben 10 was successful just feels like an understatement. In addressing the success of just the toy market for Ben 10, the main goal was to make a good product and that the toy market as a creator should not be the thing you have on your mind first. Going by the statement of, if it's good, it'll translate to sales of toys. People tend to have a radar to know when it feels that they are being marketed to with no genuine creative nature behind the product. Ben 10 was able to launch a great show, a great property, and that turned into a hit. No, a jackpot for the merchandise side of things. From the game shows that were solely themed around the series, a live touring stage show, a Minecraft DLC pack, the reach, the exposure, and the notoriety that the show had, all stemming off of just a random rapid pitch within a selection of 20, becoming this legacy title for Cartoon Network that had five different series being able to last as long as it did thanks to constantly playing with the style of the show to fit the era of Cartoon Network it would premiere in. But what now? The reboot at this point has been over for a good little while. Does the series pivot again to a new look and art style? A new sequel series to the reboot? Some form of live action or a movie? Where and how is Ben 10 going to pop up again? Because it's not a matter of if, it's really just a matter of when. One of the men of action, Duncan Rolu, had mentioned when asked about some future plans on Twitter that we are developing many options. The changing fields of platforms from cable to streaming, the consolidation consolidation of WB franchises and a thousand other factors will determine where, how, and when Ben's next iteration will finally settle. It's safe to say that there are plans in the work for the next big return to the franchise, but as of right now, these are just rumors and whispers of what would be next. There are no real updates just yet, but I'd love to hear in the comments what you'd like to see next from the franchise. If you'd ask me to describe Ben 10, I would say it's ambitious, complex, complex and large, but at the same time flawed and sometimes incoherent and full of retcons, but I don't know if I'd want to change that. It made the journey of getting through the franchise enjoyable, giving me, the viewer, a chance to follow along with the lore and to see how different series roll back or change ideas laid out before, leading to your own theories of the multiverse, timelines, what truly is prime canon and what's not, and maybe the greatest thing that has come from this is the larger fan base of the show. Getting to meet and talk with other fans, hear how passionate they are, and hear their thoughts on why they love the show. Hearing theories or making your own creations like Rob or Kiro the artist's amazing work in creating, writing, and illustrating his Five Years Later series, expanding on his take on what he would like to see. And to add on to that, the incredible work he does with Kellen, Hershey, Ryan, Avery, and everyone at the Ink Take YouTube channel, becoming the definitive lore keepers and explorers of the intricacies of Ben 10. A huge shout out to them and everything that they do. But I also want to give a big shout out to you, and I want to say a huge thank you to all of you who have watched these videos. It means so much to me. If you made it all the way through this video and even the other two parts, tell me in the comments. I want to know who actually made it to this exact point. If you enjoyed this video and the series, please do me a big favor and hit the like button for me and subscribe with notifications on for more content like this. I'll be back with another video soon, but until then, later.